Hello and welcome everyone to the virtual conference on Hyperlocal 2.0, COVID-19 Effect, How Delivery of Food and Grocery is Making a Comeback by Entrepreneur India. I'm Pritima Bhardwaj, Project Head, Webinars at Entrepreneur India. Today's discussion will revolve around the power of Hyperlocal in the wake of COVID-19, the power of going deep with Hyperlocal audiences to build richer and stronger insights. Let me start by laying out the ground rules for our attendees. The discussion will go on for approximately one hour, 45 minutes. This will be followed by Q&A session for next 15 to 20 minutes. If you have any questions during the course of the discussion, you can pose them through the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Mention in your question if it is directed at any specific panelist. We will take questions post the panel discussion. Please participate in poll during the webinar. We would also like to request the attendees to keep the questions within the scope of discussion here today and not pitch their businesses. We also encourage all the attendees to network through the chat and Q&A option and to introduce yourselves. Our first session is on how hyperlocal e-commerce is giving a revolutionized retail experience. This session will be for approximately 45 minutes, followed by question and answer sessions for 15 minutes. Let me now introduce my panelists for this session. We have with us Mr. Sunil Jain, Founder and Managing Partner, Sprout Capital Advisors, LLP. Mr. Vasudevan Chinna Thambi, Co-Founder, Ninja Card. Mr. Gautam Kapoor, COO and Co-Founder, Ship Rocket. Mr. Srinivas Murthy, Senior Vice President, Paytm Mall. Mr. Mukund K, Senior Vice President, Urban Company. Our moderator for this session is Ms. Ritu Maria, the Editor-in-Chief of Entrepreneur India and Asia Pacific, who would give the welcome note and moderate the session. Over to you, Ritu. Thank you very much, Pritima, and a very, very warm welcome to all the participants and to all the speakers who've joined us here today for this Hyperlocal uh, 2.0 conference, uh, virtual conference, I must say, that we've organized today. Now, India is uh, really, I would say, no, um, you know, it's not a stranger to Hyperlocal. Our Kiranas and mom and pops have always been Hyperlocal uh, as offline retailers at any point of time. Uh, so it's something that we have, we have been used to. Now, the thing was that how do you give a customer a better experience in what was already being offered to them as a hyperlocal uh, kind of arrangement? So hyperlocal e-commerce today is going to come in now in its second avatar post uh, and uh, I would say amidst um, uh, the lockdown that we are seeing today. And I interestingly, I see that hyperlocal e-commerce has sort of gone very broad ranged. It is today uh, applicable within food, within medicine, consumer goods, services. And we've got a great panel here today uh, who's going to talk about all these aspects and look at all these very closely. Now, you know, um, the, the, the biggest aspect of hyperlocal e-commerce, and this is for all my fellow participants over here, is that supply chain is very closely located to both the buyer and the seller. That is what makes hyperlocal e-commerce a very uh, and a very profitable and sort of a good business model to look at. Um, but, you know, what I see emerging in India, because as I said earlier, that it was not as if we were not used to hyperlocal earlier also. So what I would like to probably see is a super hyperlocal coming in maybe uh, in, the, in the coming days post the lockdown, where we'll probably not just look at two hour deliveries, but maybe 15 minutes deliveries or 20 minutes deliveries. Uh, happening to the customer. And that is where I think Hyperlocal will be able to truly find its mojo uh, in one sense, where they'll be able to serve big volumes and large customers. Now, you know, obviously the question today is that if Kiranas were already able to do this, then why Hyperlocal e-commerce? I think Kiranas were able to do it, but what they were not able to uh, sort of meet was the consumer experience, uh, the transparency, the sophistication into the whole system. And of course, to bring technology and predictability in the entire system, which um, today's hyperlocal or e-commerce is asking for, or a consumer is asking for when he's even buying regular things like groceries or, um, uh, you know, taking some services. So, um, you know, today with our panel, we're going to look at some great ideas as to what is the future of hyperlocal e-commerce, what are the new trends that are happening over in hyperlocal e-commerce. And going forward, I mean, you know, as I said, we're coming, we've come into hyperlocal e-commerce 2.0. It started essentially back in 2014-15 with some players, but 
do we see it becoming from more regional or do we see it becoming more larger more pan india probably even inter international kind of a business model and what all spans is it going to sort of extend and encompass into um so you know we've got a great panel and i'm going to start with you um uh, sahil uh, you know uh, sorry uh, with uh, sunil um, uh, jain from sprout capital what i would want to uh, first see is give an investor's lens to hyper local e-commerce and uh, give us an idea about what are the trends as an investor you see emerging in hyper local uh, e-commerce uh, both right now in covid as well as once we are out of covid sure uh, so reto see i mean uh, the investment in hyper local you know started about 6 8 months ago uh, it's it's uh, it's just that you know this covid incidents has propelled a lot of activity around the hyper local plays along uh, if you look at some of the few uh, transactions or uh, you know collaborations which have happened amazon you know partnered with more retail uh, essentially to you know spiral their hyper local uh, play into the market uh, you had uh, companies like uh, uh, you know zomato working with uh, in a collaboration with grofers to you know do a pilot around uh, delivery of uh, grocery similarly swiggy on the food side you know had uh, collaborated with a few uh, uh, grocery retailers you know to do that grocery uh, under under swiggy go which is now rebranded as swiggy genie uh, so investors have been i mean companies have been you know uh, collaborating and looking at hyper local because uh, you know it's 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 really a large market uh, what is what has changed in this covid during the covid is that people have realized that one with the lockdown uh, consumers did not want to step out to uh, the grocers themselves or the retailers themselves had at some level you know experienced lack of fulfillment from their wholesalers you know most of these kirana stores were actually uh, procuring it from local wholesalers slash um, wholesale network which at some level also had been hit uh, but the brands had production and they didn't have visibility in terms of where to route their uh, inventories into uh, a true hyper local you know definitely allows for a brand to collaborate with the consumer and collaborate with the neighborhood grocery stores in terms of enabling a true hyper local uh, which which allows you to you know uh, fulfill and uh, probably uh, take a larger share of the wallet of the consumer uh, in it in the process it also gives a visibility uh, for brands in terms of where the products are selling uh so you know you you've got a, a bunch of things which have happened in the last uh, you know few weeks uh we've seen danzo collaborating with britannia uh, itc is collaborated with domino's pizza you know to you know uh, to sell some of their products uh, through the domino's pizza uh, app delivery app uh we've seen uh, uh, id fresh launching something like uh, find my store which essentially gives you a list of stores in your neighborhood which are which are you know supplying the id products uh so i think this has been a great opportunity for companies who had hyper local plans always but they have accelerated their hyper local plans in terms of you know building that connect with the consumer with the local retailer and at the same time you know uh, these guys already have a bunch of consumers so they're taking these consumers to these retailers and enabling this entire hyper local mix which gives them a lot of credibility and visibility in terms of where to channel the partners in terms of investment i think we had a last wave around 2016 17 from a bunch of investors we we know uh, uh, almost 100 companies got funded uh, across stages during that phase uh, what went wrong you know in hindsight what probably is is you know in our view was that a lot of these uh, hyper local companies around that 2016 18 uh, you know viewed this as more as a staffing opportunity without actually analyzing how they would make uh, money out of the entire process uh i think uh two things have happened since then one digitization in india has uh, further you know deeply engaged with the consumers to uh, lingua has played a big role uh, which has enabled a lot of uh, a deeper penetration into tier 2 to tier 3 tier 4 towns uh these two coupled with you know a lot of uh, companies uh, now understanding that unit economics and supply chain is a critical part for us to make a meaningful uh, collaboration in hyper local so this realization is come through to companies and that is what investors are liking and betting around this time in terms of investing into companies uh there have been a flurry of investments in the last 6 7 months i think we continue to see a lot of investor interest in this domain uh in fact 
uh, you know a lot of uh, conversation with investors was hit during the covid but one sector where we continue to see a lot of investor interest uh, includes grocery you know meat delivery uh, agri supply chain uh, which are all linked to you know this uh, entire uh, supply of grocery and i think grocery is 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 a holy grail of retail uh and this opportunity provides everyone to you know figure out a very win win hyper local model to you know enable grocery full fulfillment so we see a lot of investor interest clipping back into this space in the next one or year uh and and you know uh, i think what companies are doing is also you know uh, trying to build channels trying to build optimization trying to build uh, digitization layers within at the back end to enable to hum enable them to have economics which are conducive to give them a longer run so we see continued interest in that space sure uh, thanks for that pan sunil um, now before we sort of get into a uh, more deep dive into hyper local e-commerce the first question and i'm think i think a lot of my audience would also be very interested to know is that how does the economics unit economics make sense in micro delivery market i mean what are the kind of volume or the orders that one has to sort of fulfill in order to be able to make it a viable model viable business model or what i say hyper local 2.0 and what is what is probably the right delivery fees to be charged i know with swiggy and zomato it has been the longest point of debate between restaurants and uh, uh, you know the the technology players uh, as to what should be the you know what could be the right margins which could be a win win so i would love for the panel to sort of take up maybe vasudevan you want to take this up and sort of suggest yeah. what what could be the right uh, um, uh, you know the the business model i mean where does it come right at what level yeah yeah so uh, so i think from a swiggy and zomato or the hyperlocal player standpoint i think this category is going to be very different from the restaurant category uh, purely from a standpoint the margins are not going to be uh the way uh you know we would sort of enjoy in a restaurant uh, uh vertical uh, given that the retailer uh, already operates at a lower margin for the fast moving products so he would not be really able to shell out the kind of margins the restaurant should be able to share here and uh, and, and since since the margin also is not very uh, there is there is no uh, you know um uh you know the scale uh, advantage for a retailer right? i mean the, the margin fairly remains the same uh, even at higher volumes for him uh, since he's a smaller retailer so so i think doesn't that way there's no challenge but but i think the way uh, the delivery companies the last mile companies want to offset is to sort of bring in a uh, you know last mile optimization where they have a delivery fleet which is also delivering food also delivering uh, groceries and 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 the food business has its own there are windows during the day where they they don't have get uh, you know as much as demand as the, the peak cars so they're going to leverage i think these uh, you know time windows to deliver some of the groceries um, etc and and sort of try and find the optimization from a cost standpoint i think that's where i think i think it's going to look more complementing their food um, you know delivery fleet and and sort of try and uh, make make and improve the cost structures i think that's where it's going to uh, i mean the way i see it is it will evolve uh maybe i think the company is going to try out multiple models like uh, either a 15 minute delivery or they would sort of go to a slotted delivery saying that you know what hey the you have a available uh, deliveries in this particular slots which slot you want to pick up uh which could be uh, the next hour or in you know, 2 hours from now etc so so i think i think that optimization would come in i think before we get there i think the company should sort of try and try out multiple models to see which works for them uh both for uh, from a cost standpoint uh, the consumer what works for the consumer um, cost for them and also for what works for the retailer so i think i think we're going to see that uh, i mean evolve over the next i think a few weeks and few months and and so sort of finally we'll have a model where uh, it works out uh, like you know like you said it it, it has to be win win for the retailer and the the delivery partner and the consumer but what is a sweet spot let's say i mean you know so as a uh, as a hyper local e-commerce player what typically is a sweet spot where do you say that okay this is where at least you know we are cash break even mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so uh, so frankly uh, i mean uh, i don't know view on the uh, the cost structures of of the delivery company i mean volumes yeah. i just want to get a sense of like what what could be good volumes and i mean you know what so basically the unit uh, cycle of the business okay um not not really i mean frankly i don't know visibility on the uh, on their business but uh, but i think i think uh, uh 
I think I think a good order. I mean, if a, from a rider standpoint, I think if if he's able to deliver about, uh, I'm just taking a guess, right? Like I mean, yeah. if he's able to deliver five to ten orders a day, uh, grocery orders. Uh, I think I think that would be a good optimization from a from a driver utilization standpoint, the rider utilization standpoint. I think that that would be a good number to start with. Uh, but but I think I think uh, I think some of these companies would be in a better position to sort of say from a sure. cost mix how it really turns out uh, for them. Sure. So, Srini, uh, let me come to you. And I know Paytm One has announced about, uh, you know, partnership with about ten thousand stores that you're going to sort of uh, partner with for hyperlocal deliveries, and you're sort of working very closely with the Kirana stores uh, on this. So, you know, uh, going forward, and you're looking to also touch about hundred uh, sort of more cities in the country in the next few weeks. Now, given all of this. uh and particularly now that you're working with kirana now how are you making sure that the kirana is also sort of equally invested in the same model as you are uh you know they they also have the same sort of goals and uh, service um, experience to the customer which the customer is looking at and you know you have similar goals uh, i mean eventually you know obviously we know that small business owners can uh sometimes become uh, very stingy about things so how how are you sort of managed to going to sort of uh, uh bring this entire gap together or bridge the gap together so i th- i think uh, we've touched upon right the, the first aspect for any retailer is consumer demand uh, they are looking at because when you look at a hyper local setup you are looking at a radius of 5 kilometers right it makes sense even for a retailer to even be interested is to start giving that much consumer demand so i'm just giving you a re- requirement of a retailer what what the what does he look at you know to bridge that gap so first is the consumer demand uh, the next thing is definitely i think a lot of our panelists have touched upon is the fulfillment aspect because today consumers are already coming to the retailer it, it's there is no uh, pain you know that the retailer is experiencing it is just that now because of this current situation and let's say even after covid also fulfillment will become a challenge because if i was delivering let's say in a particular sector which is half a kilometer or a kilometer now my efficiency can improve if i'm able to deliver within 5 kilometers or 3 kilometers so fulfillment becomes another important aspect to it so fulfillment consumer demand uh, are very very critical to start with then comes uh, uh, the angle of you know uh, we were talking about profitability and the sku types so many retailers also have a challenge to understand how to even keep what kind of skus in my store i think that that's also we kind of started seeing in a very small pilot so let's say uh, to deliver a maggi packet will always be expensive even if you charge a delivery charge or even right. if just delivering a 2 kg atta packet will also be uh, you know expensive what if we can bundle and say that can i deliver atta chawal and and oil together now can we recommend these combinations to the retailer is 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 the another aspiration for a retailer that to increase his margin also and uh, by the way we also will not incur loss Uh, uh, as a basket size so idea is to kind of increase the basket size for a retailer is the third uh, element that we kind of bring in uh, the next thing is cataloging inventory management and payments these are the other uh, aspects for a retailer that we have seen which i think uh, we are you know as as a platform are equipped to kind of solve these would at least bridge the aspirations of the retailer to what as companies that we are kind of looking at to improve Uh, profitability in, across all the value chain, across the value chain, and all these aspects is is what I would say is the important point. Sure. So at your level, at I mean at a PTM's level, um, uh, do you feel that it's this space is also going to become intensely competitive with Geo also coming up with Geo Mart and the recent tie up with Facebook, and you know a lot of players also who are trying to help digitization of Kiranas in the market. So do you think that the place is going to become very very competitive and uh, sort of the market share is going to get distributed amongst a lot of players I think the market is very very large uh, if you look at even grocery right and uh, I might be plus and minus here and there it's hardly 0.5% to even less than 1% penetration even in the grocery side right the market is very huge right uh, uh, let it be players like jio or anybody right we you know you we need to understand that we need more and more players to invest lots of money to digitize is is a very important requirement for anybody to survive right i think that's very very important for everybody to kind of do so more players will help digitize the uh, retailer much more faster is is a very positive step that we see so that you know we can build lot of newer models that kind of coming in because earlier like gross, uh, grocery 1.0 Lot of startups have come in between 2013 and 16. I was just discussing with you, Ritu. Uh, the problem was unit economics were not sorted out, logistics was not sorted out. 
people thought you know it would be easy and you know a lot of startups went bust i'm even talking about like right. 10 million dollar 10 million dollar startups because yeah. the space is so huge it's, it's not so simple that we think of right now that has changed now because swiggy zomatos food deliveries uh, companies service companies like urban right urban company uh, e-commerce companies like us are solving lot of problems across different value chains including logistics companies right for example it could be a ninja cart as as a company to solve problems for a grocery shadow facts dunzo you know, all of those so lot of newer things have solved lot of those problems right now so i would say for us it's a very exciting time that lot of digitization is happening and it's more about execution and also becoming intelligent in terms of specific focus areas becoming sharp in what it is rather than looking at it as a very large kind of thing so to give you examples today when paytm started off right now in the in the grocery thing to answer your question we tied up with rapido and dunzo now rapido is a bike company now who would imagine that bike company would tie up with us or a ola or a zomato so i think lot of these uh, in- interesting integrations are happening right now to kind of do so it's a very very i would say collaborative space at this time rather than looking at purely competition and you know taking away market share you're not even there ritu to even talk about that oh okay too early right now yeah okay and um, okay i'll come to you again shrini on another aspect but before that i am going to go to sahil uh, so sahil you know as a as a logistics aggregation platform how do you think uh, and i mean shrini has touched upon it how do you think more such collaborations are going to happen you know what we talked about danzo and rapido and probably you know you've done something with shadow facts also and danzo also so how do you feel that these uh, the i mean the logistics and the e-commerce side are going to get more or better integration in the coming times yeah hi this is gautam i am uh, representing sahil is not there today sorry uh, yeah, sorry but, about that uh, absolutely <laughs> Uh, so I I uh, I totally agree with Shrini. Yeah, I we touched upon it earlier in our uh, preliminary discussion. Also, I think it, the the value ch- value is really when different formats of hyper local businesses or businesses which are not hyper local also earlier coming together onto one platform, one ecosystem, and building this large ecosystem all together. Uh, I I believe that offline retail uh, will also offline retail of goods. Uh, which are you know even even goods uh, which are if i want to buy baby products which are fashion baby products or uh, electronics that i need to buy from a store near near my house or uh, other things those will also my regular needs can be fulfilled uh, by the same ecosystem which is supporting uh, the grocery and uh, uh, and 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 the restaurant business today uh, so that's what i think that's that's really valuable and uh, i think that's where the value is going to really come together uh, having different players i think there are different players in the market today where you have uh, where you the, the 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 courier or the logistics companies are functioning in larger different models some are working on slotted models some are working on dedicated models uh, where they have a fixed location to pick from and they are only delivering onto a particular location and these people only work for them at a particular time uh and they are not utilized for other times when the when say example grocery deliveries happen in the morning and the evening and during the day they're free and they're not going and working with zomato when afternoon and uh, in the evening the, the other businesses are uh, or restaurant business the orders are really high so uh, where different uh, right now the it's still, even though the ecosystem is coming together i think we are at a stage where it's still broken so everybody wants dedicated workforce because they want to deliver a, a promise uh and at the same time they uh, uh, other people who who are now pressed with cost and where it will help is having two different players coming together uh and saying that okay fine uh, can i be milk basket in the morning and be restaurant deliveries in the afternoon and be grocery deliveries in the evening and then restaurant delivery at night so that my margins are really well spread out and my utilization of resources is the highest because that's the real cost really and this cost is only going to go higher right uh gig economy is going to come under uh, state level uh, uh minimum minimum salary brackets etc etc these people will be given commissions to give better services all that will keep changing right and uh, something also which is very which is happening is the distance that these hyper local companies are okay uh, running towards they, uh, right now uh, hyper local for a grocery think it's not more than 1 km uh, 
uh, they don't deliver more than one kilometer. Uh, a medicine shop does not deliver more than one kilometer. This gives them an opportunity to now cater to a customer base which is five kilometers, ten kilometers also. Uh, right. And some core part some partners are doing ten to fifteen kilometers. So, for example, Danzo uh, is okay doing ten kilometers. There are people like Lala Move and uh, and We Fast. These are smaller still, but they are they're okay doing fifteen twenty kilometers also. So, so but you you gave a very good point about a, a very small uh, medicine shop let's say serving the radius of 5 kilometers and beyond which it cannot but as a player as a logistics player do you see serving his market which is of 1 kilometer you see an opportunity there absolutely absolutely i think uh, 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 i think there is i think the it's really the question of demand and sup, uh, a supply of people so as long as i i know a medicine shop will deliver if they have people right they try and give a fantastic service to their consumers the way they want it though you'll keep calling them and they say they'll reach in 15 minutes and they will come in 45 minutes Correct. but again you know the guy you will call him and the friction is far lower uh, but what is going to happen is that the demand will become more important that all these platforms all these marketplaces will big bring demand for them today they bring demand for larger companies like uh, there's a lamash uh, which is in 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 delhi and gurgaon those are larger uh, grocery stores and those those are organized guys maybe 4% of the world uh, total total grocery market or 3% of the total grocery market but really the value is in the small shop which are not digitized as uh, shinavas was telling there how do you how do you bring them on the same platform so he does not support those guys to sell those goods right it's only when those people will come on those platform they will see the e-commerce demand the demand of swiggy bringing them an order they that they have not experienced that and that will not happen until the digitization happens a lot of people have tried for a lot of uh, right. actually installed pos's png installed pos's geo did something around uh, installing inventory all that uh, is a lot of friction for them i think there is something which is new which will come out of this is uh, uh, conversation commerce I don't know. I can just, and this is totally <laughs> hypothesis. Like, geo partners with WhatsApp, they uh, create an API where they can do a conversation, and don't you don't need inventory. You just post what all uh, what you want, and the Kirana store basically responds that he has ten products out of the twelve products that you you were trying to order, and he said, okay, yes, please ship it. Now he pays the money through geo pay, and without inventory, without cataloging, you have. the kirana so shipping the order and grab is something which is partnered with geo uh, and grab delivers the goods so right so there's a lot of like six or seven people integrating in the entire ecosystem i'm just saying that maybe it's just leaf frogs uh, beyond catalog and inventory because that's primary very important i don't know i'm just this is an hypothesis yeah thinking right? aloud <laughs> okay i'll come back to you once again uh, let me go to mukund mukund are you there Uh, so uh, you know my question to you is while you know while right now what we've talked about is mostly uh, related to uh, food and it's mostly related to grocery but you know you manage another side which is very interesting that is of services and i mean you know i know uh, before urban company when at a time when you were urban clap you had far more range of services but today you sort of become more concentrated on services and i'm sure post covid you will also find that there are certain services which are high in demand like sanitation or probably you know uh, some such services which did not exist earlier now how are you getting ready for that and i mean you know how how is your business model going to be enable to service that uh, uh, those those services to the customer sure i think uh, firstly i think we've always tried to be hyper local uh, so i think the model was not very different before as well which is uh, we always used to onboard people locally the only thing we used to add on top of it was a uh, pretty pretty stringent training as well as help with product procurement because many of them may not have access to product as well so those were the two things we were doing on top uh, i and i think that will become more important right now just as a simple example uh, in the last 4 days we have shipped 12000 uh, personal protective equipment to all our partners and and, and i think just buying any of this offline is going to become fairly challenging for many people at this point of time so just to get our plumbers electricians and all our sanitization people back up and running we've been able to kind of uh, do a lot of changes and very very quickly react to some of these things in fact we've been working with startups like moglix and shop and bizongo to help us do this 
so i think many of them are also coming up and seeing how to make uh, make supply chains work in, in this context so to answer your question i think we'll stick to the same strategy and as you rightly said for things like sanitation which we have recently launched we we are very aggressively bringing on board people with already these capabilities we i don't think in this new world uh, we can do classroom trainings and onboarding so one we have significantly moved our training online people are actually there are virtual classrooms now where uh, all our professionals are getting trained and we are onboarding digitally that's i think the key change we have done so we have not changed our strategy of standardization or uh, keeping tight control on quality just that we have moved uh, i think we 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 were forced and now i think we feel digital might even be better than offline uh, we realized in training so in the last one week we have managed to quickly launch an app for all our partners to get trained online and so do, those are the things we're doing and as you rightly said we're bringing on board a lot of people to uh, you know fill up these new niches so we are onboarding at full rapid pace as we speak sure you know um, um, so this is this was a practice in offline retail that we had noticed and I, you know i also run a retailer magazine so i've been uh, sort of following the entire retail industry very closely for so many years uh was that you know when when they were opening food and grocery stores eventually they started going into private labels wherein they had their own products uh you know and uh, because there were obviously better margins on those products do you see an opportunity at the urban company for you know your own sanitation products or probably at some point of time your own brand right now you're an aggregator but your own brand which could then be you know selling its services at let's say the platform i mean it's it's obvious opportunity here i mean many salons in fact 30% of their revenue sometimes comes from products so we are not oblivious to that and i think at the right time we will do it in fact for a lot i mean i don't think many people know this we almost uh, ship fairly reasonable number of quantity of products every month to our partners on the b2b side already uh, for all our 30000 partners and uh, some of the products already are developed just for us so these might be things we work with man company to develop something or sarcher for us so we i think we also want to be smart about saying we don't know how to do everything so let's also be smart to work with the right folks to learn and and use their capability so i think we've been partnering and building specific products for us because for instance when you're at home you need mono doses you can't have a big bottle of a conditioner when you go to someone's house you need, the user would prefer that it's used and throw especially in the no, new covid scenario nobody wants to use the same product in multiple instances so everything needs to be mono dosed so that it's very safe and also the user knows that it's the product is the correct product and the quantity is correct so we've worked with a lot of brands to make some of these things for us and i think the right time some of these things like disposables are already made only for us uh, and i think at the right time we may try a few but we are also cautious that there are expertise needed to make many of these things so we would rather partner with a lot of brands rather than uh, do things on our own at this point in time sure um shrini um you vasudevan would you have some views on this as to how private labels might emerge at uh, you know your own stables going forward so let me start with shrini yeah i, I think uh, traditionally also if you look at it while we now call it private labels traditionally in typical stores also jo bolte na khula mein bechte hain like you know people right. just they, we are used to you know just people walking into a store and you know buying sugar dal aata chawal without any brand name actually if you actually look at the staples and and i think uh, that that's what is happening now in if you look at players like uh, uh, big bazaar or grofers or a big basket like everybody are coming up with their own label now and i think that's what does also happen in a typical retail store and i think it will emerge a lot certain categories i think there is element of trust for it say it's to do with skin personal care there you don't want to experiment a lot but when you when it comes to food like ghee uh, oil or let's say atta dal chawal and all of these i think you don't really remember brand except for ashirwad and some of these which do come in in the urban phenomena but still private labels is where the margin is i think that will keep emerging a lot and already we are seeing uh, that that's what is happening today when we order also sure um vasudevan yeah i think uh, i think a lot of the retailers i mean the small time retailers i mean uh, like like i think shima said they already uh, you know run a uh, you know the the private label in a sense where they just buy bulk and then like you know in a sack and then they just pack it and give it i think uh, that will happen but i think with ipo local coming in people would want to know what brand they are ordering and then what sort of because just to ensure that there's a quality um, so i think a lot of these would move to a lot more branded play at least a familiar brands that people can trust 
because when you go to a shop, I could see the product and buy. But vis-a-vis -vis when I order online, I would uh, rather prefer to stick to a uh, familiar brand that I'm, I know. Uh, so, so it's going to be, uh, I think it's, it's going to be, I think the consumer is going to move towards a lot more brands than buy something at a very loose um, one. And, and, and I'm, I'm sure the a uh, lot of uh, new players would come and who predominantly operate on the hyperlocal supply, having a dark stores, uh, you know, just scattering to the hyperlocal play. I mean, we we will we'll see players coming into that space as well. So sure, this is how I see uh, things would, from a consumer standpoint. So Neil, uh, you know, we've already seen a play in um, food delivery. We've already seen a play in food and grocery medicines, which were always sort of with, uh, prior to pre-COVID, they were always off and on with the government regulations also have sort of jumped into it. Services, of course, as uh, urban companies are already doing it. Now, what other categories do you feel hyper-local uh, we might see in the coming times? Uh, so, Ritu, these, these are some of the obvious categories in terms of, you know, where we've already seen some hyper-local. Uh, I think a few, you know, like services, uh, if you, if you look at services, right? I mean, uh, urban urban company has a lot of beauty services, but uh, you could probably see a lot of healthcare which can get into home. Uh, what has happened in the COVID and which is not, you know, largely been highlighted uh, largely is that a lot of patients, while they've been able to access the hospitals, the hospitals are turning them away because they're saying, please go get a COVID negative test, right? Which has led to a realization that, you know, can we uh, insource this at our homes? So I've seen a lot of, uh, diagnostic lab companies who are sending personnel to their home uh, to pick the blood samples to get the tests done. Uh, companies like Portia who are actually providing uh, care at home. So this is healthcare services is another area which I think will will see a lot of propelled uh, demand post this episode. Uh, given largely, uh, you know uh, what has happened to companies. Uh, the other area where uh, you know potentially. Uh, you know, we could see people moving towards uh, home is is in the category of, uh, which is also alternative medicine. I mean, it's the entire Ayush segment, uh, right. you know, Ooh. which is alternative to the core medicine, uh, where uh, we are actually, you know, looking at companies uh, where uh, uh, inquiries slash orders slash deliveries have gone up like 2x over the last 30, 40 days. Uh, again, related to healthcare, but these are areas where we see a lot of uh, demand. And, and just to, you know, I mean, on your previous question, there's just one view which I would like to share, uh, which is which is regarding, you know, whether a private label would be, uh, is, is something which uh, companies, so if you, if you look at Domino's, right, I mean, they do 1.6 deliveries per hour in the US uh, and, and they've aced, they aced the, you know, 30 minute model, they cracked that. Right. Uh, you know, it'll be very difficult for someone to beat that in India. I mean, maybe, you know, companies will get there. And if you do the entire bath around it, you know, whatever you do, you'll end up at a 40 to 50 rupees delivery cost. And which like Gautam mentioned, will you know, always go up given that there'll be minimum wages and stuff like that. Uh, so for in a, in a true hyper local, it will become imperative for these companies to, you know, have private label products at the back end, which they will power these stores with. Uh, and, and, you know, that will give them the margins to, you know, uh, then optimize their delivery costs. I mean, I mean, they can only optimize it will be cost to a certain extent, but the margins from uh, having private labels is the one which will, you know, bring out overall unit economics for these companies. So I think it is going to become imperative for companies to, you know, think of full stack, think of having a few categories which will become private labels for them to, you know, service this market. Sure. Sorry, uh, I, 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 sorry I, I took you back a little bit, but yeah. No, that's fine. <laughs> in fact, please jump in wherever you want to make a point. So we, we're quite open to that. Uh, sure. So we, I also see, you know, we've got about 107 uh, participants right now and we've got about 30 questions coming. So I think let's also involve some of our audience um, over here. So I think there's a question from Amit Gupta. Can we pass on the um, uh, question to Amit Gupta, please? Chirak, can you give him the audio? Okay, till Amit comes on the line, I, I have another question, which is about contactless delivery. Now, you know, while we're talking about uh, social distancing and we're talking about what could be the future of delivery now, the contactless delivery, while, you know, it sounds just the right thing to do in times like this, but it has its own cost. Uh, now, who, how do you sort of, as an operators, how do you see 
uh, you know how do you how how is it a pain, how is it a pain for you i mean you know what what is it and particularly mukund for you everything you do is contact based so in contact delivery times what are the extra costs that you have to bear and who's going to bear the burden of those costs yeah let me start on that i think uh, i mean first this some of it is crystal balling right i think the truth is this is not a one month two month pandemic this is i think going to last for a while uh, unfortunately or fortunately so i think so we are looking at it as how do you solve for a longer period of time and not just uh, something short term so we have kind of hence put a lot more elaborate uh, kind of systems around it so one is cpe of course which is not obvious like gloves masks all of this will become standard for all our partners um, second we are also doing temperature checks that's where tech tech becomes a big like so today right before every job in fact we're doing a temperature check and all of these checks on partners to make sure they are comfortable uh, we are also then having telemedicine support for all our partners so if you so we've linked with the arogya setu app so if you are saying you have certain symptoms we're immediately connecting our partners with doctors uh, with with through our insurance cover to make sure that we quickly check if there is something wrong because the only thing we can do is be very very proactive <clears throat> of the day testing capability is still limited and so we can't test at exhaustive levels at this point of time and hopefully that will come through at some point in time so we are taking all preventive actions which we know uh, can be done and we are also taking disclosures from the users saying at their home they are safe because we need to be sure both sides are safe not just that the partner is safe so all of those protocols i think we'll put in place we will learn a lot i think these are just first uh, one percent of things we may need to do i think there will be a lot of learning in the next month or two on cost we are Uh, i i think some of it will be borne by the user that's the truth i think there is no way to subsidize many of it uh, so we are uh, thinking of adding a small fee at the right point in time saying the safety kit fee or one of that it will be a very small number uh, a few tens so that some of these can be uh, supported because the the ppes and all we want to make sure it's it's a single use we don't want to create more trouble so we're putting in a lot of checks to make some of these things happen uh, and some of these costs Uh, will be shared between all the three players, which is you, the user, urban club, uh, urban company, and the partner. Sure. Um, you know, uh, Gautam, what is your views on this? So, as a logistics provider, how are you going to sort of see the cost of contactless? Um, doesn't sort of mar your economics. Uh, Ritu, the cost does not. Uh, uh, I understand the cost. Uh, is a big factor when it comes to ppe products because i think sanitization of uh, hubs uh, and ppe for uh, the delivery boys etc is is a big cost uh, this is largely on the core company or our partner side uh, right now what we've seen in the market today is uh, that all of them have uh, in their agreement uh, companies like rudat and fedex have kind of brought uh, a new charge uh, they are not specifically for uh, ppe but they because of the margin slipping away and overall the market i think is in a larger turmoil because the demand is not so much in the market today uh, it's, uh, the demand is not so high uh, though they have problems so they have uh, they have a term in their contract they're all increasing their cost by 20% so they have done that uh, at least at least the traditional listed players or companies like rurak and fedex have done it uh, the new companies uh, have not done it yet Uh, but i'm sure they will come under a lot of cost pressure this these are things which will obviously bring some cost maybe not very very high but at least it'll, it'll be a cost on every individual if they want everybody will to wear gloves mask is easy mask is cheaper uh, and i'm sure there are masks which are washable and can be used and uh, single use masks and uh, it will eventually come to that uh, and everybody will have a mask right i as an individual will carry a mask and it's my own safety then a company providing me a safety but other things like in the in the in the in the hub or in the sortation centers at, at uh, you know there'll be some cost of sanitization uh, i think testing of is not a big cost but i think ppe is the only cost which is uh, primarily will, will be important and i mean sure. individuals take it up or the company take it up uh, i think our behavior will change for the next one year at least so i think in for short sure. and if not more <laughs> okay i see amit gupta is already there uh, can we give on the uh, audio to amit please hello we can hear you amit yes ma'am uh, actually mera ek question tha ki jo feedback aur reviews hain aaj log jo purchasing pe jaate hain wo reviews pe bahut kuch dekhte hain theek hai na 
तो कैसे रिव्यूज को मैनेज क्यों क्योंकि क्या होता है रिव्यूज आदमी जब ही देता है मोस्टली जब वो एंग्री होता है जब वो सेटिस्फाइड देता जब मोस्टली वो अनसेटिस्फाइड है तब वो रिव्यूज देता है तो रिव्यूज को कैसे मैनेज किया जाए So I, I can jump in there, uh, Amit. Uh, so I think there are companies which have figured out how to, you know, uh, get customer reviews. I mean, if you look at uh, in in the mobility category, Uber, Ola, you know, uh, probably almost force you put that screen up to give you a tri- tri- uh, rating for the trip before you pick the next trip. Uh, similarly, in in Swiggy and uh, Zomato, you have similar options. Uh, uh, you know, Eat Fit. Uh, sorry, uh, Cult. Uh, which is running these online classes is now you know uh, before you do the next session you know you typically get these screens so i think people have have figured that out with with the onset of smartphones in terms of how to get reviews even from customers who are satisfied i'll just add something to that uh, what sunil said yeah. amit what you have to look at ki aapko dekhna hai ki kahan pe wo customer satisfied hai so right after purchases or when you know the customer is happy it's the right time to capture the positive feedback you're right customer will give you negative feedback but it's very important to capture positive feedback when you know it's a positive customer so make sure that you send out communications and you take uh, reviews from the customer uh, and maybe you can motivate them by giving them a small cash bag or something which which they will bring back and they will order more from you etc sure uh thanks amit rohan varma is next can we pass on the audio to rohan please Hello, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, so my question is regarding the food delivery. So uh, before uh, the pandemic, we saw Swiggy Zomato. They 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 said they they're doing really well. And I actually run a hyper local uh, uh, cloud shared cloud kitchen, like a co-working uh, kitchen based out of Gurgaon. So we we learned that the partners are not making any net net profits because of high commission and forced discounts. And now because of pandemic, we see orders also also declining. so what happens to so much investment in this space and uh, you know food uh, delivery in general who would like to take this sunil so i i mean you know amit so i am doing some work with a company in that space uh, right now uh, so i think see fnb fine dine is going to take some time to hit back uh, it's going to it's going to be the most affected sector people are going to resist going out Uh, but once that once lockdown opens uh, home deliveries or food delivery uh, from restaurants is something which will continue may not be to the same extent as as it was earlier but that's that's one of the sectors which will pick up very quickly uh, for for players like you who offer infrastructure services i think uh, you know there are companies who are now looking at options of having multiple brands under the same kitchen uh, and like someone uh, someone had mentioned earlier you you need to figure out uh you know how you can utilize that or skim that infrastructure across the day so you could have you you will probably have to launch brand i mean or tie up with brands who can do breakfast lunch delivery uh and and probably you know fit in snacking in between stuff like that so that's the only way you can utilize your resources and uh, uh and you know try to optimize your costs by having multiple brands in the same kitchen sure uh our next question comes from vijay agarwal uh can we pass on the audio to vijay please hello we can hear you vijay yeah so i have two questions uh, one for uh, i think vasudevan would be able to answer better so when do we see things restoring back to normal as in uh, at least not every uh, it is not for the entire day maybe every day few hours the shops being open uh, on a realistic picture when do we really see i don't see like maybe next three months because even today groceries are not allowed to open every day where i stay yeah so they are opening every alternate days maybe for few hours and that too they are out of stock so as it is they don't get any business even if somebody is paying rentals it will be very costly for them to operate on a day to day basis mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah so i think i think uh, i think one can only speculate there right i mean i don't think so i mean even i'm looking at the and so for the same when uh, things going to get to normal um i think i think only things that i think we could do is sort of prepare for the worst and then like you know hope the best happens um from all standpoint but i think i think uh, as we speak i think uh, some uh, state governments have started relaxing in a very uh, selective way uh, they opening up stores for few hours uh, just to ensure the commerce kicks in 
and the consumers are you know, able to you know purchase what they want to purchase uh, so i think i think i think it's going to take at least a few more weeks to really get a uh, clarity of what sort of models would uh, work for us uh, i think like mukund was saying before i think it's not going to i mean like the entire pandemic is not going to over be another couple of weeks i mean it's going to take some more time to before we really get the pandemic out or it could be months or it could be you know more than that so so i think uh, i think i think we'll have to figure it out i think i don't think anyone has answers uh, to in terms of when this is going to get over it, it's all about how well we can prepare ourselves and then like you know um, come with new processes and models that could sort of work in this new world so that's how we're looking at uh, i think uh, from ninja car standpoint how we approaching it no so i mean you know just to add to what to what vijay asked uh, i mean i understand that you know obviously grocery stores even while they're uh, uh, supplying essentials they still have rentals to meet and they obviously within that frame of 4 to 5 hours they're not able to sort of fulfill enough uh, to meet their own costs uh, to the right level so do you think they can up it i mean for example if it's a window of just 11 to 5 that they're doing it what part of the business can come from on store sales and what part of the business can come from hyper local uh, deliveries so i mean just thinking loud yeah so i think from a category standpoint i don't think so this will be difference between uh, you know uh, the physical uh, purchase versus the online sales i think all categories going to take off especially i think categories like fresh vegetables and fruits daily uh, breakfast items home care person care will will see lot more um you know uh movement in the hyper local play because that's going to be a lot more impulse and then top up purchase um so i think i think uh, the retailers are figuring it out i mean i'm sure like retailers are renegotiating rents rents with their landlords for these months to sort of see uh you know whether they could reduce the rent or you know if they could sort of push it to the future and things like that so i i'm sure like retailers are figuring it out uh, how to operate and having said that i think a lot of retailers uh, are operational i think except for the cities where there have been time based restrictions uh, let's say for example in bangalore uh, i mean we have seen retailers operating uh, till uh, from morning till evening and then like you know uh, they have customers coming in uh, plus also online delivery is happening i mean retailers delivering on their own because their customers have their own numbers and ordering it uh, i mean and people are figuring it out uh, i mean I, i don't think there is one answer for this but um, and i'm sure there is going to be retailers who are facing challenges but uh, but but i mean like it is going to be i mean they want to figure it out at a their own levels sure uh, deepak verma is next is he online uh, yes i am here okay we can hear you thanks him. thanks to you uh, and uh, thanks for all the panelists for their wonderful uh, uh, suggestions and recommendations i have two questions first question is uh, let the grocers play on uh, low margins very low margins ranging from 10 to 15% on most of the products that they sell so how do we manage the delivery costs the tie ups and other logistic costs um, uh, you know when reaching out to the uh, kirana stores and uh, importantly the traditional kirana stores are uh, may not be very much willing to work on apps or uh, text for their order management because you know they would want Uh, a very fast rotation of the orders they don't have that much of time to look at the app and text not not everyone at the store level also so how do you suggest that we should be uh, solving this problem second question is how uh, what do you suggest that uh, how can we improve the customer experience and how to ensure faster deliveries to be ahead of the competition during these times because it is very much important like most of you have mentioned that 15 minute delivery or 30 minute delivery dominoes have correct 30 minute idea so for the kirana deliveries uh, or essential deliveries what do you suggest would be the best way to uh, you know uh, be ahead of the competition shrini would you like to take that up sure so i think uh, let me take the first question and within the first question the first part uh, i think the question was how do we kind of recover the logistics cost and you know how do we kind of cover that there are two ways to look at it obviously one is uh, also the sku type higher margin products bundling combinations of those will definitely improve margins there on that front on the supply front two is uh, obviously customer has to pay a convenience fee uh, when you are delivering something which is faster and closer closer to it so it is not hit on the retailer as well as the company i think those are the two aspects that i would say kind of come in and there are different models that that can you know emerge on this Uh, on the on the second part uh, i think uh, uh, i just want to kind of ritu what, what was the question i think on the second part was i think to do with uh, how to be more competitive in terms of time so about 10 minutes 15 minutes so how do you so the, obviously the guy who's able to deliver the fastest and the best way is correct, going correct, to correct. 
so i i think uh, in, in that way the way to look at is not every product is also needed very immediately certain products are needed faster than every other product let's say to, to do with milk or certain uh, what do you call a regularized products need much more faster and you know they have a shelf life and everything like meat and all of those certain products people can wait and that is how you can slot it uh, between delivery time so let's say I, i could wait for a delivery for an oil or an atta let's say by evening that's okay for me but let's say milk or something meat or other things are needed much more early for me like 15 20 minutes that again is where you know you could kind of evolve models and you know stay competitive that way because not everything is promised or delivered in 15 to 30 minutes is not possible at all so i would i would say that's how you kind of need to look at look at uh, that sure uh, so we have another question from shivang gupta can we pass on the mic to him please Hi everyone. We can hear you, Shivang. My question to was given, sir. Sir, like, uh, can you please tell me like how Ninja Cart is doing in this tough time, and how we are onboarding retailers? Like, many retailers are like they are not working entire day, so how we are onboarding them? Yeah. So, uh, I think that's a challenge. I think onboarding new retailers is a challenge now. Uh, what we've done is. uh at the city levels we have you know rolled out uh, you know uh, helpline numbers for retailers if someone wants to you know uh, get on boarded and then by one and also there is a lot of word of mouth between the retailers i mean if i'm a retailer i know there's other retailer who is buying from ninja cart i sort of check with them uh, details of our uh, you know our managers and the sales associates and and they sort of reach out to our sales associates and then we get onboarded them and onboarding can be done virtually we send them the app and then uh, they just install and then we guide them uh, to how to get onboarded so that's all currently happening the movement is restricted i mean our sales folks are not you know, you know uh, traveling as much as they travel before in the lockdown so 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 mostly we planning that way uh, and and since we uh, when pre covid we had predominantly at least on- onboarded most of the retailers uh, in the city uh so we using those data data to sort of you know reactivate them or or whenever and we have inbound numbers where retailers calling us uh, to get on board uh, activated so that's how we managing at this point from a demand chain point sure anish is next anish kumar yeah hi we can hear you okay uh, so hi uh, this is anish i'm a uh we are actually a team of researchers from plymouth university uk and iit rurki so we are working on a project for resilience in food supply chain so i wanted to ask how does hyper local model uh, affect the resilience and survivability of food supply chains during this covid pandemic who are you asking it to uh, any of the panelists may, may answer this uh ninja card would be better if you yeah, could yeah so uh so, so the way i understand is i mean see there is i mean the current uh, times there are challenges from a operation standpoint right i mean there is a restriction on the vehicle movement there is a restriction on the employees movement uh, to an i mean to the warehouse uh, uh, etc and there is a challenge on the farmer side uh, not from harvesting but from availability of labor for harvesting um, etc and, and most importantly i mean what you've seen as a trend uh, no at least few weeks i mean like in the initial few weeks is the farmers have stopped sowing new crops uh, because there were a lot of uncertainty around uh, you know the marketability and then who's going to buy etc um, then then we had to sort of work uh, closely with our farmer partners to sort of assure them to sort of start our, i mean like sowing new crops so that there is availability at least two months from now so those are i mean those things had a disruption in the first few weeks i mean like first week uh, especially and then post that i think each stakeholders have figured out how to operate in this constrained environment uh, i mean the government played a big role in terms of enabling passes um, you know regulating some of these things uh, so so i think i think i think we, we, i think uh, i think each folks will figure it out i think farmers will figure it out how to you know get back to farming uh, and you know start putting in new crops and harvesting and then like you know supply chain partners will figure it out i don't think so there's going to be a big disruption in terms of uh you know on the supply chain front for the uh, fresh produce or the food supply chain um i think i think things are already back in uh, normal in mo- most of the places at a very structural level um so so i think i think it's it's, it's going to get improved i think what what's going to change is uh you know how how we operate uh with these constraint and then people would 
look at um, some of the uncertain elements in the supply chains uh, i mean would, would sort of go down and people will try and invest or you know prefer more and more of certain elements in the supply chains uh, that's how we see the trend emerging sure uh, so we will not take more questions in interest of time but you know before we wrap up i would like to ask this one final question that you know uh, as i said in the beginning there are a lot of local players who are emerging in this you know local hyper local startups and with you know trying to address very small regions do we see more consolidation happening in the industry post covid wherein you know somebody who's let's say built a capability in chandigarh or somebody who's built it in coimbatore and bigger players like let's say pdm mall or even ninja card they might want to collaborate with them and look at an inorganic growth in that particular city or region do we see that forthcoming um, let me ask start with shrini on this Yes, Ridhu. I think uh, that that's already started off. Uh, I think even pre-COVID as well. But I think now COVID time has accelerated to really identify complementing strengths between two companies. What they can do uh, specific areas again. It might not be a takeover or it might not be a investment in a larger way. Could be leading to investment, but complementing strengths and actually tying up with those. It could be let's say uh, utilizing the inventory of bikes or inventory of cars. could be an example right to kind from a logistics point of view or it could be somebody would have solved a supply problem where the cataloging is been done for a retailer and everything or third somebody would have solved a payment problem let's so let's say in a case of paytm i can talk that qr codes are already in the kirana store so i don't need to solve a payments problem so i think each each of them have solved certain areas because it's a very very large uh, gamut we will see acceleration happening a lot for sure and i think more proactive collaborations will happen sure um uh, what about you vasudevan what do you think about this so i think uh, i think some of these players i think would would uh, you know start replacing some of the elements in the supply chain right i think i think uh, moment any supply chain that involves too many people to sort of come together to deliver a service i mean it sort of uh, creates more uncertainty or it, it takes away the margin uh, in a larger sense at a very fundamental level uh, so i'm sure i think as like i mean as we said like as we collaborating I think uh, in a coming together to sort of put this uh, service together, but I think in long term, I th- I'm sure uh, you know uh, uh, the the last mile and the the last mile companies like let's say the Swiggy and Zomato, and so would look at uh, you know building some of these capabilities themselves because in other day they own the customer on the front end level, right? Uh, so so we will see uh, people building complementary capabilities in house because that improves their margin structure, also brings a lot more. Um, you know a uh, strong customer experience and certainty in the entire uh, process uh, but but i think i think for now i think the chance of building that is limited so i mean we have to partner each other but but i think i think in the months to come i mean each companies will figure out uh, what works for them and then like you know what what they could build and what they could uh, you know partner with so that's how it uh, i see but but i think number of players offering uh, would this at a, at a consumer level would would, uh, would surely consolidate maybe it could come down to about 3 to 4 players Now, though the market is huge, uh, I think I think the people with the cost efficiency will win in the long term um, on the last mile front. That's that's going to be the expensive piece um, from a short term point. So, so we will see consolidation in the last mile piece. Uh, but yeah, sure. Uh, Sunil, what is your what does your investor lens say? Yeah, so I I, I mean uh, what we are seeing is that there will be consolidation. Uh, there will be large regional slash national players emerging. Uh, where we see a lot of consolidation happening is integration backwards into the supply chain uh, by a lot of uh, these players who own the customers uh, on the front end, uh, driven largely by you know creating positive unit economics for the investors. So that's an area where we see a lot of consolidation happening. Sure, uh, I think there is somebody uh, who's pinging me about this one question he has, which is. how do you engage retailers grocers especially in the tra- traditional kirana stores for order management uh, when they may not be interested in looking at the app text for orders so i mean you know it's essentially about uh, breaking the mindset of a traditional small business player so shrini maybe you want to talk about this it's from deepak verma i think there's no straight answer to that like i said somebody might be comfortable with apps i think everybody has a feature phone which has some kind of internet connectivity today i think that that's been solved right now so i might not call it an app but kind of a messaging functionality or you've seen things like you know khata book kind of things kind of coming in right now uh, what we've seen also is i'll give an example of paytm has this paytm for business app 
where people can even type those. So I think people are comfortable to an extent because connectivity, internet issues have been solved. Not everybody are like that, but again, it's an upgradation, staggered kind of learning that will happen. We should solve this problem. Sure. Um, Just you know, to add. So, so, sure. Go on. Go on. Yeah. Vasu, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. No, just to add to that, I think uh, I think this this was a major challenge when we did uh, also did a B two C IPO local in 2015, 16 times. Uh, I think the getting the retailer to sort of uh, you know interested and invested in this whole uh, model uh, because forum is always going to treat it secondary uh, in terms of getting the inventory updated, uh, you know, giving priority service to online orders, etc. Uh, but I think I think with the current situation, I think that's going to change because the retailer is going to look at this. As a as as a, as a significant channel of demand, so that that mindset shift alone uh, would sort of propel uh, him to prioritize the online uh, channel in terms of getting the inventory updated, um, you know, ensuring catalog is right, pricing is right, the experience is right. Uh, but but having said that, I think I think that's that's going to be super important for the center model to succeed. I think if the retailers uh, don't come in proactively and participate, uh, embrace technology, I think that's going to frustrate. The uh, you know the, the front end companies right because that's going to take a hit on the customer experience, right? So so I think I think the retailers will catch up to this because they will sort of uh, know that this is the only way to sort of move forward. I think the, sure. I think adding to what Vasu said, the survivability of the retailers they have to learn and adapt also, right? That's how it will happen. You know, retailers also will have to adapt to survive uh, on, on this digital age. I think that will also start happening. Sure, Mukund, I think I we left. You, when it came to merger and acquisitions and consolidation. So I would love to hear what you have to say in the services area. I mean, cash is king right now. I mean, I'll be honest to say not, we will not look at anything inorganic at this point in time. Um, we will sure. preserve try doing as many partnerships as possible. Uh, too much uncertainty, honestly speaking. Uh, we will let it play out for some time. Of course, you never say never, but there's too much uncertainty for the next two quarters to take a longer term view on anything right now. So I think it will start with uh, formal contracts and partnerships. And I think they may evolve over a period of time in our case, but uh, not anything active at this point in time. Sure. So thank you very much for this discussion. I think some great points that came out of it, of course, uh, Kiranas would be digitized uh, going forward and a uh, lot of hyper local uh, players. Uh, so the opportunity for Kiranas is to go a little big in terms of the radius that they are trying to address while for of course the hyper local e-commerce players it would be a great opportunity to not just meet the smaller radius of uh, uh, delivery but also to meet the larger radius of delivery and service it through the local buyer and the seller uh, of course there is more consolidation on board the bigger opportunities for bigger players would also lie in creating private labels and their own products and own brands which might um, be more uh, margin heavy in the future. We also see some great new sectors coming up as Sunil pointed out, particularly in the health services space, uh, which may see more hyper local uh, intentions coming into it and therefore more startups and ideas uh, cropping up over there. And finally, I think uh, there might be a lot of tie ups and collaborations that will happen in order to create a bigger force. Uh, Sunil, a parting point, do you see the market getting uh, divided into smaller startups or one larger, uh, you know, a Paytm mall or a Geomart, which would be probably be taking the lion's share of the market. So in, in, in the short term, I think there will be multiple players who will uh, try to enter the space and try to you know, optimize. But in, in a longer range, I think there will be consolidation and, and you know, we will probably have eight to 10 players up and in India level. Sure. So I'm into that. Thank you very much once again for joining us here today. Thank you very, very much to all the panelists for sharing some great inputs over here. Over to you, Pratima. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, all the panelists. Thank you, Ritu. It has been a very good discussion. Uh, moving on to our next uh, panel for the day. This panel will be for about 50 minutes, followed by Q&A for about 10 uh, minutes. I would request all the attendees to keep having uh, the questions coming. While we may not be able to take all the questions, but we'll try getting them answered later on as well. Uh, our next session is on-demand delivery, the logistics of hyper-local best practices for building partnership with merchants and delivery agencies. We have with us on this panel, Mr. Prashant Mehta, partner Lightbox, Abhishek Bansal, co-founder and CEO Shadow Fox, Chakradhar Gade, co-founder Country Delight, and Kapil Makija, CEO, Unicom, Unicommerce Solutions. 
Our moderator for this session is Puneeta Sabrawal Kapoor, Deputy Editor, Entrepreneur Media. Over to you, Puneeta. Thank you, Pratima, for the kind introduction. So it was an interesting uh, session prior to this, and now we are getting into the second part of the discussion, which is about uh, the logistics of hyperlocal, best practices for building partnerships with merchants and delivery agencies. So hyperlocal delivery has unlocked a new dimension of convenience and safety for consumers, as well as earnings for delivery partners during these extraordinary times. As this category continues to scale up with the goal of providing let me start uh, with uh, the investor in the panel, Prashant, with you. Prashant, we saw a bunch of startups uh, which had launched ventures previously to ride the boom and subsequently raised venture capital. Those models, however, failed due to poor unit economics. So this time around, do you see it's going to look better as an investor? What's your take on this? Yeah, I think maybe um, before we dive into this, just take a minute to to get a sense of the lay of the land. You know, we've uh, we've invested in several companies that cross the chasm between hyperlocal delivery, um, uh, supply chain, and food and groceries uh, from uh, Rebel Foods, Waycool, and Denso. And so we've gained a very unique perspective of what's happening during this time. And on one hand. While this is a crisis of a lifetime, we're also seeing an opportunity of a lifetime. I think this is an opportunity for us to rewrite our businesses. Um, I, Prashant, your voice is not clear. What we're seeing is that uh, things were shut down. No, let me just turn off video. Maybe that'll help. Is this any better? Yeah, better. Yep. Okay, we'll go with this then. Um, so we noticed that during the, the four to six week period, we, we experienced everything from warehouses being shut down to employees not being able to get there. Um, and six weeks forward, um, we're actually seeing most of our operations get online between 40 and 100%. Um, so I think one of the things that we're learning about this is that while there was a crisis and there's, there'll continue to be a crisis for some time to come, um, there's a big opportunity for us to rethink how we operate our businesses, to rethink business models um, that can allow us to deliver our services um, at better unit economics. And we can go through that as we go through the discussion. We're seeing improvement on business economics across the board, um, you know, four to six weeks later. Uh, and we can go into that. Um, we're also seeing that it's an opportunity to recognize some both short-term and permanent changes in consumer behavior, which we had never predicted before. And we're taking advantage of some of the changes in this behavior to improve our products, improve the experience for our customers. Um, and, and, and you know, just catching some piece of the last panel to also look at different ways and unique models in which to partner with uh, both um, uh, merchants as well as hyperlocal delivery folks. Um, and ultimately, one of the things that you know, we're spending a lot of time on, which we think holds the key, is continuing to hold the team together. Uh, and it's something I didn't really, I'm not sure if it came up in the last panel or not, but um, we think it's, it's incredibly important to hold the team and the morale together uh, during this period. So I'll stop here. I'll let everyone else introduce themselves. But I, I guess in a nutshell, we're seeing an opportunity to rewrite business models to improve unit economics. And, and we're seeing it every day uh, across the board, our economics are improving. So before we get into this discussion, I would ask uh, Abhishek to please uh, introduce and talk about uh, the impact COVID had on the business right now. COVID has been probably the most disruptive that has happened over the last two decades for some of the online delivery companies. Uh, as you know, India definitely has taken a much more companies taking in the China and the US. And hopefully this is all for the best and we can be able to recover pretty much soon uh, the way it is happening right now. 
but uh, overall i think it has had a significant impact both in terms of from a regulatory perspective as well as from a customer sentiment perspective i think every market um, we are seeing like there's a massive downfall of demand as well because the customer sentiment uh, is like to stay indoors and not to order from outside anyways am i audible better now yes abhishek you are yeah okay uh, so i think uh, the sentiment has definitely taken a big dip uh, and uh, it is going to take some time to recover uh, in terms of getting some of those volumes back obviously the entire non essential category is not working so that like that already contributes to about 60% of the overall e-commerce volumes in india or retail volumes in india which is like zero right now so the only place where you see a lot of action is the grocery and the food which essentially come in the uh, essential category so from so what we are seeing right now is like the impact is very different in different markets uh, a lot of markets there has been a, obviously a significant impact because Uh, the shops are not open the uh, uh, i would say there are various bottlenecks in even the back end supply as well which is not uh, enabling the platforms to fulfill the customer demand and also we are seeing there a lot of market lot of major markets actually where the customer demand has dropped down because of the overall sentiment to stay indoor than to stay safe so i think that's broadly what we are seeing uh, in the market today uh, i think the only um, hope that we have is that uh, at least what we have seen in china is that some of these online markets actually recover pretty fast post the covid time uh, the volume actually stabilizes to pre covid volumes pretty soon and in some of the category we actually start seeing growth as well because from a long term perspective ordering online and getting things at home will be considered to be slightly more safer as compared to going outside and shopping out where there is a high probability that you will get in touch uh, with someone else or individuals out there so kapil uh, let me move to you and uh, ask you about uh, as a tech provider how has been the impact at your business and uh, has there been any best practices which you would like to share yeah so uh, just to give context gd commerce uh, is a e-commerce supply chain saas platform but uh, we are at the center of the ecosystem uh, which connects with marketplaces with uh, logistics providers like shadow packs delivery and erp systems and point of sale systems so we are a we are the platform which enables that these partners are able to communicate effectively obviously covid has impacted the overall economy uh, macroeconomics and it has impacted us as a company as well uh, because non essentials e-commerce is not happening but uh, at least in the essentials category what we've seen is we've seen a week on week jump of 70 to 80% uh, for our customers who are in the essentials category so that's a hardening trend i think it is also forcing brands to think about set up and take notice at least these fmcg and pharma brands that we need to now take the direct to consumer strategy very seriously uh, so consider this as a two fold change for them these brands have to move from a traditional b2b mindset to a more direct to consumer and within the direct to consumer they have to th- think about now hyper local and we are having very interesting conversations and we believe that in hype, uh, with these brands about how to enable hyper local for them so uh, because hyper local will require a lot of these multi- uh, partners coming together uh, we are seeing very interesting partnerships happening very recently flipkart tying up with uber spencer's retail or a jio mart facebook uh, deal that has happened i think a lot of these interesting partnerships will uh, come uh, come forth and these partnerships have to happen at least in the short term for this uh, for a seamless experience that we can offer to the end consumer in technology we i believe personally technology will play a very important role in this because without a central ecosystem they will these partners will not be able to communicate effectively with, with each other and the supply chain will then continue to be broken so chakrada is coming to you uh, a quick introduction from your end yeah uh thanks kunidra for you know having me here uh, country delight is a uh, basically a direct to home consumer brand we are probably uh, the largest direct to home consumer direct brand to home consumer. Uh, serving directly to the direct to the customer we serve nearly 2 lakh families uh, with milk and other fresh produce uh, direct to their doorstep uh, we are uh, basically a full stack model and that has enabled us very very strong control uh, over our supply chain even on the worst day we could serve mm-hmm. 92 to 93% of our consumers so which has been a good strength uh, to what we have done learned a lot 
uh, you know, and when we attacked this problem, we attacked it at three levels. One at the frontline level where we work with our delivery partners and the production employees doing a number of things, uh, varying with, you know, insurances for them, enabling uh, them with uh, uh, waters in, in case of the production facility, building good sanitization measures. Uh, second, at the business level, went went uh, quite deep on tech to build monitoring systems and security and safety systems across the business to ensure safety of our delivery partners. And third, at the consumer level, innovating a bit on the business model, whether it's on uh, the payments front or whether it's on communication with customers for changing their delivery uh, schedules or constant communication about you know the measures that we are building to build more transparency and trust the consumer level. So it's been a great experience and would love to keep sharing more as we go forward in the discussion. So, so Prashant, coming back to you, would you like to share some more insights into uh, what we can see as the more evolved business model and cost structures in the coming times from startups in the hyperlocal delivery space? Yeah. Um... You know, maybe maybe a good place to start is to look at sort of what behaviors are changing, um, and at the consumer level. And I think it's already you know we've talked a little bit about this on this panel. Um, one of the things is for at least essential services, we are seeing um, a lot more openness and adoption to order more of their essential services uh, delivered to their homes, um, and in some cases. Uh, essential products, which we didn't think were as essential, are becoming essential. For example, um, in Dunzo, we're seeing a lot of people ordering pet foods. Didn't probably look at that as being essential at any age, but people need it. They have pets and uh, uh, they need to make sure they take care of their pets. Um, medicines, of course, that's always been there, but we've seen a huge increase in, in that category. Um, and of course, groceries and the daily essentials, clearly we saw that. Um, so one is the willingness by consumers to be much more open to uh, order food online and get it delivered. Um, we think some of this will continue for sure. Um, you know, and, and, and for us, we've seen that in the first few days, of course, there was hoarding. But today, beyond the first week or so, um, we're seeing consistent behavior of people wanting to receive this um, directly to their homes. They're seeing that the ability of transparency they're getting uh, in terms of both the quality of products, um, the fact that you know these are no contact deliveries, um, they're getting information on temperatures of people that are delivering, um, something that if they just walked into a store, uh, they may not be able to get. If you walk into a store, for example, at, a, at a, either a local merchant or a, or a large merchant, you don't know who else has touched that product. You know? um, but here, at least people, um, whether it's perceived or real, they're clearly getting a better sense of security. We're seeing something very similar also in the case of say Rebel where people are open to getting more of their prepared food delivered at home um, because we provide a lot of transparency uh, and, and information about, about who's preparing your food. So I think consumer behavior is definitely changing um, at least in this category um, and we think that it'll continue to change over time which means that merchants will also need to change. They'll need to change what they stock, they'll need to change the kind of information they get, um, they'll need to change how they deliver uh, ultimately their experience. Uh, not everybody may be open to walking into their stores tomorrow. So how do they leverage uh, the, you know, the host of delivery networks that are out there, the hyperlocal delivery networks that are out there? Um, and where we're seeing a change there is, if you can provide a lot more insights to that merchant. You know, today or yesterday before COVID, a merchant was stocking whatever a distributor generally was pushing on them. You know, the distributor would give them a lot of incentives, merchant would feel good about it, and I'll stock it. Of course, the merchant would have some sense of what are fast moving items, but beyond, you know, a handful of things, a lot of it was also pushed by distributors. Today, with say, for example, Dunzo, we're giving merchants so much more insight into what they should stock, when they should stock it. Um, that kind of insight is helping them not only get the right SKUs,
but having the right SKUs means they can fill, their fill rates are improving. Their fill rates are improving means that their inventory churns are higher, which ultimately means that their cost of working capital is going down. I mean, this is a, uh, it's amazing within literally six weeks, merchants are seeing the value of these insights and this information. Um, and the ones that are willing to adapt, the ones that are willing to look at technology and information as a way to run their businesses better, um, we think are gonna survive. We think that some of the merchants that don't adapt uh, probably you know, won't survive. So we're seeing massive changes um, at, within a business model, both from a change of behavior from a consumer point of view and willingness to order more, improve frequency, um, and from a merchant adapting newer technologies to gain more insights, to then change what they're actually stocking and how quickly they stock those things. Um, so those are kind of the key changes we're seeing between consumers and merchants. Um, within our businesses, we're also adapting newer mechanisms to enable uh, our ability to serve our customers better. For example, um, in the case of Waycool, uh, 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 an agri-tech platform that we have, what we found is that um, when a particular market was shut uh, during the, the crisis and, and apartment buildings, for example, weren't getting any food, we were able to convert our warehouses, which never really were built to service direct customers. We were able to convert our warehouses, which are fully automated, to service large apartment buildings overnight. Um, it's an opportunity we never thought. In fact, we were trying to stay away from, but we saw that this is something that users need, customers want, and can we service that? And a lot of this has helped us retool uh, a significant part of our business. So these are just some examples of how we have seen, uh, you know, seeing an opportunity to service our customer better uh, and then changing your business model to adapt. And, and I guess in all of these things, what we've seen as I started the conversation, um, you know, because the, at least these businesses tend to be focused on essential services, um, we are seeing a huge improvement in our unit economics uh, across these set of, set of companies. So I think that uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really important time to sort of sit back and see, you know, things you never tried before, um, you know, it's, it's a great time to try a few things. Not everything is going to work, uh, but have to have that openness uh, to go out and push new ideas um, and see if they can work. You'd be amazed of how resilient, you know, the, the ecosystem can be if you can really get out there and try different things. Interesting. So, Abhishek, coming back to you, uh, I'm sure you would also have developed some new practices in these challenging times. And would you like to share some insight into uh, how delivery in these times has shaped us, shaped up differently? Yeah. I think uh, ever since the lockdown has been happening, um, people like us um, have been obviously at the forefront in terms of doing some very interesting, innovative, uh, innovative thing, as well as like, uh, like we believe that obviously the amount of innovation and the things that we change is going to be very very critical for even the for even our uh, client, which is essentially the um, uh, platform that we work with to generate back the customer confidence. And uh, I mean, obviously, like the biggest thing in mind and the biggest thing that we have done about is in terms of how do you make your entire delivery more safe, more safe for the merchant as well as the delivery partner and obviously the biggest of them the end consumer and because the moment like uh, you start seeing some of those negative effects or you basically see there is a tip in customer sentiment it really really impacts hard on the entire ecosystem i'll give you an example a couple of weeks back i think there were a few cases uh, or at least one case that i can uh, discuss about which like which got exposed where basically a delivery partner had a, a symptom of covid and it eventually tested out positive with COVID. Now that entire thing had a significant impact on the entire customer segment on a pan India level and there is, there is like a significant volume drop that happened throughout every possible platform that we could uh, know of. So I think safety is the big, big key for us and I think that's where we have spent most of our time innovating and figuring out how we can do it. I think I'll talk about some of the interesting things that we have done and these are learning that we have had from some of the global system that we track very, very closely today. 
I think one of the biggest thing is how do you like ensure that your delivery boys are safe and basically the entire concept on contactless delivery. How do your delivery boy operate in a way that he does not get in touch physically with anything out there in this entire ecosystem? So that requires a lot of change in basic flow, the way delivery happens, the way you behave at a merchant, the way you behave at an end customer. How do you track some of those moments at a pan India level? I think that is something where we have worked a lot actually. Uh, the second thing that I think which comes to my mind where we did a bunch of innovation was around how do you capture whether your delivery boys are using masks, they are having hand sanitizer, they are basically, they know about the right uh, precautions that they need to take in order to ensure some of these things. And how do you do it at a pan India level where like, for example, today we have around 25,000 daily active people. Okay. Uh, and we need to monitor any, or like any process that we need to create. We need to ensure that this basically gets replicated everywhere. So we actually we built a very interesting selfie system. Now it works on a basis of an image recognition software, which essentially captures the photograph. It basically tells that whether this guy is like is wearing a mask or not. Now, every activity that happens after that is the fact whether the delivery person is wearing a mask or not. And orders get allocated only if that particular person is basically wearing a mask or following a certain protocol. Now, this is again something very, very important and interesting that we ended up doing. The third thing which I can talk about right now from an innovation standpoint is also on the fact that Basically in every city, like the world has actually become so much more hyper local that in every area where you have to operate in, you have to take a permission from a local police system out there in order to operate and basically deliver essential. In some of the most critical urban areas, you actually have to create passes for each and every deliver, uh, delivery person to actually go out there and operate uh, in that system. Now, this is like one thing we actually came up within just the next three to four days when the lockdown started. And uh, what we had was we had a system on the app itself where basically a delivery person can apply for a uh, pass. He gets a pass on the app itself and whatever necessary permissions are required, you actually show it on the app rather than basically having any sort of a physical intervention in doing this. And this was actually a big, big thing for us to actually get the people back on the platform and get them working because we were able to instill the confidence in them that whatever they are doing is first of all legal, it's completely safe and they have all the necessary documents in place to actually operate in this particular zone. And uh, like initially we had like, I would say underestimated the kind of response that we'll end up getting by bringing something like this. But today about 90% of our daily active users actually visit this particular page on our app more than once a day. So I think those kind of fundamental things in, in terms of how do you ensure the safety of the entire ecosystem uh, has become very, very critical in times like this. Sure. Thanks. Thank you for such insight. So Chakradar, coming to you, uh, how has be, have you seen the spike in terms of delivery orders coming at uh, the Country Delight app and how, are, how have been your response towards answering those? So, uh, Punita, the first two, three days, there was a 2x, 3x surge in volume from both existing customers due to hoarding and uh, uh, new customers who were not able to find uh, reliable services across. But we sort of prioritized our situation to first serve our existing consumers who we've been serving historically and because we operate on the subscription model. And for us, what we care more about is people who are regularly with us. And uh, we sort of ensured that even on the worst day of the lockdown, 93, 94, 92, 93% of our customers got their milk deliveries. Now, this has been a little bit of a rare achievement uh, 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 across the ecosystem. And uh, this has built a lot of credibility and word of mouth in our business. And uh, this has led to a lot of positive effect from the customer point of view because uh, uh, one, uh, we give products which customers love and two, uh, uh, there was a lot of reliability that they could bank on with the country delight. Even in places like Pune where things were extremely, extremely difficult, you know, our delivery partners uh, risked a lot and uh, and sort of get got the product out there to the customers. That has seen a further uh, improvement in the business. So I would say that between, let's say, March 15th and today, our business has jumped nearly like 40% in overall uh, value. And uh, and uh, in, in terms of regular customers, they, they, they account for 
30 percent of the increased value and 70 percent of the increased value was by uh, new customers the second learning uh, which we had which which really helped us a lot is communicating a lot with all stakeholders and uh, which which includes basically your customers as well you know uh, sending updates that hey tomorrow's delivery will come at 2 a.m instead of 4 a.m and you know driving your entire system to make that happen gave customers a lot of confidence because they it showed the effort that the company was putting to 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 make sure that you know we don't even lose on one day of milk to you and that in turn uh, you know uh, got us a lot of positive brand love and uh, loyalty in terms of uh, business second now uh, you know as uh, some of the panelists abhishek and prashant have also been sharing uh, uh, we have gone a little uh, uh, deep on tech as well uh, you know apart from showing whether people are wearing masks or not we are trying to capture their temperature data real time start building analytics on this uh, we are uh, working on this whole arogya setu app which is again a very brilliant initiative by the government and my only hope is that they open up the apis for uh, you know people in the morning delivery ecosystem because the information that they have at a country level or at a community level is far far deeper than what as individual businesses we can uh, do but at least for now we are trying to uh, you know work our way manually to build the images and then have our systems read those images and understand how many of our delivery partners are, are at risk and you know hence categorizing them accordingly and and the third thing which we have done is provide a lot of assurance of safety to our delivery partners so if anyone calls sick they get paid for two months there is no questions asked about uh, you know this for our delivery partners so people who are worried about their monthly income do not have to worry about that so much and you know focus on their health as well as their ability to function in the future the second thing we've done is like taken a 1 lakh rupee insurance for all our delivery partners again this these were these were done in the first 2 3 days which really helped build a lot of trust and confidence with our delivery partners and as a company we've also built a culture where we really uh, you know hurt if we are not able to uh, deliver uh, even one day and that has sort of allowed us to come through this crisis in a much stronger way and even going forward we plan to you know keep this going in the sense that uh, you know covid is a part of our life a part of your business expense has to go into safety and security and communication with all stakeholders in the business and we should uh, not shy about it anymore is is what we are feeling uh, so sakadar i have another question here so uh, coming back to operations uh, delivering in these times i'm sure must have added uh, to multifold increase in the cost of serving each order so i mean how are you looking at that is it going to imply long term losses on you as a company or are you passing those costs to the customer how do you see that playing out in the long term see in the long term whatever uh, so one uh, as a business cash is king today and it is just not possible for us at least uh, even though we are a profitable business at least or a break even business uh, we are it's not not just possible for us to take on a lot of fixed costs so wherever there was a cost increase we've kept it as much variable as possible for example uh, there was this surge in orders and we are doing more business than we were before but what we did was uh, pay our delivery partners for double shifts rather than hire more people this has uh, you know given them more income during these times and also helped us keep our cost structure very nimble a uh, second thing is for example in our production facilities some of them are working on full capacity we quickly move to take on lease uh, you know some of some other production facilities uh, for a very short term period even if it is costing us a little bit higher rather than take up long term contracts and keep things uh, incur more fixed cost so at least on cost basis our approach has been highly uh, nimble agile and uh, flexible uh, even if it is costing us a little more temporary so that we can observe the permanent trends that are coming out of this and then take permanent calls but if at any point of time we feel that uh, uh, you know there is a permanent cost structure evolving into this 
like for example you know masks and sanitization equipment is a permanent cost structure and if it starts hurting our survival only then we will pass to our customer otherwise we will try our best to absorb it as, as a business because this is not a time where we really want to take too much advantage of on any side at all okay sure well coming to you how technology uh, do you think has uh, shaped hyperlocal and specifically helped during these times i have been talking about how they have built technology to help their fun- company function uh, within the hyperlocal space i'll talk from unicommerce's perspective because we interact with these key three key stakeholders which is one brand on one one side the merchant who's actually going to deliver on uh, the second and the delivery partner uh, i think what we are enabling is this entire stack through which all of these systems because each each of these stakeholders have their own systems uh, and they need to communicate effectively with each other uh, the brand needs to get the customer order they have to be enabled to become a direct consumer uh, country delight has done that but there are many fmcg players large fmcg players who have not even thought about direct to consumer before this so i think as a technology player we are helping them enable become direct to consumer then tying them up with the logistics providers uh, multiple logistics providers so that they are able to serve different pin codes and finally enabling the merchants because a merchant needs a lot of hand holding for them it's a new thing while they may be getting insights from dunzo and others but it's a very new trend and they need some basic systems for them to be able to make some good out of these insights so we are helping provide that system or integrating with the system for retailer or a kirana store is already using that all of this has to ha- work seamlessly for an end consumer to be able to get full visibility on the order from the time they have placed the order to the time that they have delivered for example uh, we talked about that the delivery is happening at 2 am instead of 4 am this kind of communication also needs to happen through a central system and uh, that's why this ecosystem needs to be built and unicommerce is kind of powering this ecosystem and we can leverage this from the scale that we have got because we are serving almost 20% of india's e-commerce today so we understand how things operate as at scale and we have worked with 10000 plus smes already so we understand the psyche of an sme also how uh, the hand holding needs to be done for them to be able to adapt the technology ultimately it's the kirana store who's going to play a pivotal role for the deliveries or or the customer demand to be met and those need to be enabled and that is i think where we are playing a very crucial role uh, by either onboarding them on our platform or tying up with providers who are already working with them. so prashant coming back to you like you had given the example of way cool and others i mean uh, for these hyper local brands do you see uh, this spike in uh, the orders is going to be a lasting trend or is it just during the lockdown i think if you step back um our overall food habits are not going to change right you know um at the end i think we're going to consume pretty much what we consumed yesterday and I, and a month ago is probably what we'll end up consuming uh tomorrow and and 6 months from now you know it'll it'll have its sort of natural growth that that the country has gone through over time um having said that where the differences will come is one the kinds of food um that people will consume um we're seeing that people are going to want to consume more healthier food categories um somewhere there's a perception that that also means that you know that food is better for you and it's not touched you know any virus or etc uh, not sure that's always true but that is you know again a perception that i think we're going to see happen we're going to also see that how people receive that food will change so while the total consumption of people's food eating is not going to change the types of food they'll they'll consume how they'll receive the food and what their expectation is going to be so for example in waycool when we deliver anything to a to a kirana store or a retailer or or a large restaurant um we're because of we're a fully integrated platform our customers are now asking us where did this product come from or if this product wasn't well can you take it back because it's 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 not good we're able to trace that product back to the actual farm 
So that level of transparency is something that you never expected both individual consumers to seek, nor did you expect you know, retailers and, and, and other customers to seek. We are able to now, because of the technology platform that we have in a fully integrated platform, are able to actually deliver on that, which means that you know, people are gonna to wanna to see more of that type of information going forward um, and, and we'll make decisions based on who can provide that kind of information uh, versus you know, just walking into any random place and picking up what they want. Of course, you'll see some of that too, but we're slowly starting to see this new uh, expectation creep in. And I think it goes back to both what you know, uh, Chandra and, and also Abhishek said is trust. These are just different forms of how do you drive trust? You know, we talked about you know, trust with partners, delivery partners. One of the things that you know, we're looking at is, in the case of Dunzo, if there was a retailer that was a very popular retailer, at some point you might find that there might be 50 partners waiting there to pick up you know, groceries. What we realize that, A, in this environment, that's not a good thing. So we use a lot of our technology to enable throttling, meaning making sure that we only limit how many orders a particular you know, retailer might get per hour to ensure that we are improving the essential safety of our partners by doing things like this. So I think we're seeing changes in behavior of what consumers are expecting and what customers are going to expect. Um, and we're also seeing changes in behaviors of what we, you know, what we should deliver to our partners, uh, which we think will kind of drive trust. One example is in the case of Rebel Foods, you know, we were the first in the world globally to print temperatures of every single person in a kitchen on your receipt every single time you get an order. Now you've seen a bunch of other companies globally try to do that. But it was amazing how many times we received responses from customers saying, oh, wow, this is, I, I never thought this was possible. You know, so I think consumers are going to expect more transparency um, because I think they'll also see that that to be equating to more hygienic food, higher quality food. Um, and, and, and I think that we're going to have to invest in these things. And to your question, you know, are these investors investments going to increase cost? Absolutely. This is not a cost free, you know, venture. Having said that, we do think that at a very philosophical level, these are the right things to do. So now as a business, we've got to find ways in which to improve our economics, uh, improve our margin structures, to make sure that we can keep doing this post the crisis. And what we are finding is that, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, to give an example, in Waco today, with half the staff that we have, mainly because we're just not able to get as many people back in due to some of the restrictions the, you know, the government has placed, um, we're able to deliver the same amount of output. Now, somehow we managed to do this. I don't know what that means, you know, uh, going forward, but, you know, kind of, the nature of this crisis has forced us to rethink how do we do more with less? And that's helped us actually improve our economics. We were nervous. How are we gonna, how we're gonna absorb this cost initially? But now we see this as a more permanent way to, to live and, and to provide this kind of transparency um, to customers and that's gonna improve trust ultimately. So Abhishek, uh how are you dealing with uh, these issues like labor shortage, which plays an important role in the, the supply chain logistics part of it? So I think, see, uh, different legs of the logistics ecosystem are having different kind of labor problems, okay? Um, if I look at the overall last mile gambit of things, actually the labor problem is not that intense because what happens is that in the last mile activities, uh, the labor that basically the people who actually do a lot of deliveries are staying nearby only. They are basically urban guys who end up doing a lot of delivery because there are a lot of restrictions. Like they need to have a bike. They can only get a bike if they have a residential address or uh, like a lot of activities get involved when they are uh, like basically staying in that particular city. So what has happened is actually in the last mile side of space, because the demand has drastically fallen down, the e-commerce delivery has completely shut down. Um, from what volumes that were happening pre-COVID, almost like 70-80% of the volume don't happen right now. So interestingly, on the last mile bit only, there is an excess of number of delivery points who are there on the ground who are available uh, with companies like us as well as like 
a lot of similar companies. I, I am sure Dando, for example, might be having an excess number of delivery boys to what uh, they were probably having before. And it's not that big a challenge to find more people as well because uh, the number of sources through which some of these guys can make money is also very less. Delivery is one of those sources where people can actually make money in today's tough times. And that is why I would say on the last mile, there is actually not a lot of labor shortage. Where you see significant amount of labor shortage is towards the back end supply chain, where I would say mostly in warehouses and distribution centers, where let's say hundreds of people used to come together and work. Now, one of the good strategies that companies have been able to work on over the last decade or so has been that you basically bring hundreds of people from a rural area, you mobilize them into an urban zone, you give them housing and you make them stay over there and they'll come day in, day out and work over there and they won't even run away. Okay. And this is a very tried and tested model, which works in manufacturing, which works in housekeeping, which works in even logistics, warehousing everywhere. Now, this is where the maximum problem has been coming because people are running, like people want to go back to their homes. People want to, because they don't have enough opportunities and they like want to be closer to the families. So the way we are hearing and the way we are understanding is that wherever there was a labor aggregation and uh, wherever there were people who were mobilized from rural areas into urban, that is where you find the maximum amount of challenge today. The third piece where we are seeing a mixed sort of a reaction is basically the trucking community, okay, which there are two kinds of trucking communities out there. One is the intercity trucking community, which is like, which moves big trucks. The second, uh, the second one is a basically the small truck community, which runs for intracity sort of a distribution. Again, in the intracity sort of a distribution network, uh, I think the disruption is not that high because most of the local people only uh, move around in trucks. And that's like one of the places where we are not finding too much labor issues. Where we are seeing a lot of labor issues is the entire intercity bit where movement from the factories to the distributors is restricted, movement from factories to warehouses is restricted, moving from a particular warehouse in any part of the country to every other part of the country is completely restricted. And that because if people are not there in the warehouse, there's not inventory getting packed at the right time. It is not getting dispatched at the right time. People don't have enough earnings to make and hence people just don't even turn up for work. So it is having, I would say a ripple effect right now. And uh, the major place where we are seeing people struggle is the intercity bit when it comes to logistics. Another interesting fact is when lockdown happened, and this is something I think it came in some of the leading media houses as well. Uh, when lockdown happened, suddenly there were like millions of trucks which were stranded at state borders. Okay, you can't move those trucks. For us, we had more than hundreds of trucks which were standing at state borders. And until about two weeks from that time, when the lockdown uh, happened in the last week of March, two weeks, those trucks could not have been moved. Okay. Now imagine a life of a truck driver or a life of a single truck operator. If I own a truck or I run a truck, a fleet of four or five trucks, if my half of my fleet is stuck on the road uh, and my drivers are stuck over there, there's nothing I can do about it. Okay. It took government like a couple of weeks to realize that these guys need to be allowed to move. Otherwise, first of all, the inventory is getting wasted in those trucks. Um, secondly, this is going to create a major labor issue. Now what? that has done is it has actually created a very negative sentiment in, into the trucker and there is so much uncertainty that a journey, for example, a Delhi to Bombay journey, which anybody can cross in like about 36 to 40 hours on road. Today it is taking close to 60 hours because there are obviously various checks in between. Now this is creating so much apprehension between the trucking community that they don't even want to go for such long routes and they just want to like go back to their villages, stay at home, stay safe. Uh, until there is complete clarity on the regulatory front of it. So I think that is where we are seeing a lot of disruption. If I talk about it, it's the intercity as well as the warehousing bit. And if there is disruption right at the origin, we call it the origin logistics. Okay. Then it has a ripple effect for the entire uh, supply chain um, and it flows obviously to the last mile. So we hope these situations will improve even after the lockdown uh, basically vanishes away. But our idea that it might take actually a couple of quarters to come back to where we were just about a few months back. Uh, Punita, I'm just going to add a comment on this. Um, sure. you know, I think, uh, Abhishek, you're, you're absolutely right. I think the next phase of, of the issues that I think we are seeing um, is, you know, one, if the trucks are not able to move intercity and it's taking long and they don't want to move, actually uh, go on those routes, um, it's also going to Im uh, impact um, 
you know, the core fruits and vegetables that are traveling across the country. Um, we're already seeing, and I know this has been, you know, reasonably well covered in, in press, but it is important to know that while today, I think in some of our businesses, we've been all fine. Um, I think that we're going to see a next wave of issues crop up when farmers are producing crops, but not able to move it off their field because no one is willing to pick it up and then take it across, you know, state lines. So if it's within the state, within city limits, you know, those, those kind of fruits and vegetables and produce will get consumed. Um, but if, if goods need to move longer distances, um, I think you're gonna see the next level of issues crop up where um, it's just gonna sit there, it's gonna rot. Um, and in many cases, farmers don't even wanna sow the, the, you know, the crop because they're, they're, they're seeing this issue come up. And so you could see a situation where in some cases, um, particular uh, fruits and vegetables may not be available in the market. So you would see higher prices for those or, or just complete lack of availability. So I think this is going to be a real issue uh, in the midterm um, that we are definitely monitoring very closely and trying to lock down uh, as many suppliers and farmers as we can uh, uh, to entice them to actually uh, you know, crop the plants. Um, so that, and, and we're making commitments to them that we would actually pick up a minimum of this much so that they know that their effort you know, won't go in vain. Uh, but this is going to be a, a, a much more fragmented macro issue across the country. And uh, I'm not sure that there's a, a large scale solution to this. I think each of us will try, you know, are trying to solve it at a local level um, where appropriate, but I think this is gonna be a big issue. Yeah. So I think just to add on to what you just said. So I think, and also to earlier, one of the answers that you had done that this in this growth that we have seen, especially in some of the essential categories, will it sustain or not? I think my answer to that is that a lot of things that were happening earlier, probably in a more fragmented manner, probably in a more uh, distributed uh, phase-wise manner, I think will start getting consolidated a lot. So even like companies like Waycool, they are probably they are doing a fantastic work in consolidating the backend work. I think demand and probably the adoption for some of these things might radically increase. And six months, 12 months down the line, we might see a lot more proportion of goods getting moved through some of the organized players. The second thing around what we believe are the macro trend that is happening right now is that a lot of things will start having a more hyperlocal effect. Hyperlocal, not just from a last mile perspective, but even from the sourcing perspective. States would want to become self-sufficient in terms of what they are eating and what they are uh, consuming because like the interstate movement is not going to be that easy in times to come. So people will try to probably narrow down the supply chain, maybe have local sourcing methods for everything that they want to the consumer to consume out there. What this will also lead is that there is going to be an integration between the offline and the online supply chains. Today, most of the companies who are working in an online, who are providing an off, online supply chain, they actually don't very well integrate with the offline supply chain that has been traditional out there. They end up building like parallel supply chains. Our belief is that, that these supply chains will start getting more integrated. The online platforms and the online players might actually, rather than building a parallel supply chain, getting it from the farmers or getting it from the factories, might actually start sourcing to some of the omni-channel platforms which where like the offline supply chain might have an access uh, uh, within the same city. Just to like simplify that and explain. And this is where maybe like a lot of people, even in this panel, might like uh, get used to and uh, might find a great opportunity out there is for example if let's say there is a like just taking an example let's say there is adidas who is running multiple shops within the same city today if you are selling an adidas shoe on the uh, on any particular website you actually have to source it directly from adidas from their individual factories or from their warehouses now what will start happening and what we call this as a classic omni channel opportunity is a lot of this inventory um, uh, which is there lying in those particular stores right now where consumers are not even feeling safe to come and basically get uh, some of the transactions done. Uh, they will start getting those inventory points online and uh, you'll seeing a lot of these omni channel things getting fast tracked and I no, like for example, Unicommerce over here is doing some fantastic work, and maybe Kapil can add on to this particular thought. But we are generally seeing a lot of action uh, when it comes to the way, like the traditional supply chain will become more and more hyper local moving forward. Kapil, would you like to add to it? Thanks, Abhishek. 
So yeah, I also agree that with with the changing consumer psyche now, uh, like we uh, we just referred to a survey done in the US, where more than seventy percent people feel that in the near term they are not going to visit a mall. More than fifty percent will not visit a store. So all and all these brands have invested in real estate, wherein they put up these fancy showrooms. In short to medium term, a lot of these brands are now gearing up towards. Uh, converting these outlets into mini warehouses and serving customer demand, rather than uh, because, uh, like they rightly said, intercity movement is now uh, getting stuck. So instead of de- delivering it from their warehouse, which was traditionally happening in the happening in the e-commerce supply chain, it will now transition to an omni-channel supply chain where the store starts becoming a warehouse for them, and they will start serving consumer demand, and that is where technology also plays a part where, because. now the store inventory needs to be visible to the end consumer and this is not going to happen not just in apparel uh, even in grocery etc we're talking to a lot of large brands and we are in fact collaborating shadow factory in e-commerce collaborating for a large fmcg brand where they want to enable hyper local fulfillment through the kirana store uh, for a fashion brand they may control the store inventory but for a fmcg brand they don't control the end kirana owner so that is why the kirana store guy needs to be onboarded Need to share his inventory so that the orders can be done. So I think a lot of uh, not from a not only from a demand shifts that may happen in the short term, and we believe that they, this will impact in the long term as well. But even from a supply side, we we will see hyper local trends coming in. Sakadar, 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 on the demand side like you know i was uh, speaking the other day and we were speaking to an fmcg company large one they were telling me that around 9% of their sales is through online channels before the lockdown i think and they see that it should become 30% very soon and uh, that is the kind of demand jump that is going to happen uh, through online modes and consumers who even like country delight consumers most of them are people like half wives or you know the people who are like 60 year old who have not had the traditional comfort with technology and are having to get used to the new normal and as businesses we are also being more friendly and trying to use tools like whatsapp which they have uh, used more commonly to become more approachable and uh, non uh, uh, what do you say uh, uh, something that they should not uh, fear so but you know at a broader trend it looks like online behavior is going to jump multifold uh, even in uh, our economy uh, as as it is with the global trends and online businesses are going to uh, benefit very significantly from it fmcg companies are also shifting more of their focus and energies uh, towards working with online players or themselves having online methods of uh, reaching out to uh, customers and uh, and uh, and adding to what prashant was saying earlier uh, there is this whole uh, aspect of consumer trust and transparency that is going to constantly evolve consumers are appreciating more transparency and demanding more transparency like you know once there was this incident where one delivery guy affected 72 families in delhi Uh, all our consumers started asking us what what are you doing about it and then uh, the more you talk that you know hey food is not something where you can trans, uh, transmit covid especially when the packing is completely automated and we are following 100% contactless delivery and and you keep sending this message and every day we are thinking of sending the arogya setu app screenshots to our customers so sending the screenshot of temperature we are anyway doing so adding more transparency and visibility to the consumer uh, uh, into how we are doing things builds a lot of confidence at the consumer level and this is something that i mean it's not going anywhere like there will be people in the future where in every business where people will test positive for covid and as a business we need to invest in the necessary um, confidence building systems both at the employee level as well at the consumer level and in the infrastructure to work ourselves around these things so on that note we'll now move to audience q and a there are some interesting questions lined up uh, can we give the audio to uh, mr suresh babu
Hello. Yeah, hi. Uh, question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, nice to meet you all uh, in this way. Maybe I think it is a good way to uh, communicate uh, in your take time in your the right time this time actually. So actually, uh, as uh, Mr. Abhishek was uh, pointing out, uh, like uh, we are working, uh, yeah, we are working on a uh, vending machines. automated vending machine uh, and there was a conversation happening like warehouses can be converted uh, directly to a mini mini store uh, so yeah that that is the where uh, we are currently working we are working on like uh, the machines we are finding places to keep in this challenging time uh, so uh, so shop in shop is what the concept we are going with like uh, we are finding places we are trying to locate places inside the shop as uh, as you told kiranas get converted into uh, uh, online panel system where we can keep our panels there ready made panels and uh, the product getting displayed so this is one one of the thing uh, where uh, we use the existing space and uh, i have a question like uh, if i am creating my own brand i am i am we are in the creating our own brand in a, in a franchise mode right now so to get the spaces in a big commercial uh, spots like uh, is getting a big challenge okay. and uh, another the two things we hurdles we are facing is uh, going to the franchise model is getting a space that is the first concern and next the i am i am hearing about uh, national vendors vending association uh, they are the local uh, they load the machines with the kirana stuffs and other things so i need to have some on insight about uh, all these things yeah i think uh, um, again uh, would be tough for me to comment on the national uh, vending machine association and their constructs of working today but i think from a real estate perspective yes it is definitely a challenge getting a trust uh, that you are basically following the right norms uh, everywhere but again i think following safety norms bringing confidence into your real estate customers that how safe your entire end to end process is and probably proving that over a period of time should be uh, something that can be a good start to do uh, but uh, i think it's generally going to be a very tough time bringing in new model because like the because the vending machine sort of uh, works really well in commercial constructs or residential complexes and these are the two places where we are seeing the maximum resistance um, in terms of uh, getting an entry because uh, like because this is where like a lot of customers stay in and even for delivery perspective like i mean at least 70% of the complexes where we deliver to we are not even allowed to go inside the main gate uh, i stay in personally in a like a commercial high rise building in bangalore and like nothing is allowed to move inside our gate like there is not you can't even get your friends inside or you can't even get your uh, like anybody inside uh, right from household help to anyone so this is generally a bit of a challenge uh, uh, right now getting confidence of these real estate guys and i believe like doing it safely in a few areas and then probably thinking about scaling it up might help Sorry, I think I was on mute. Uh, we can have the next question from Mr. Vijay Agarwal. Uh, can we give the audio to Vijay? Hello. Yeah, please ask a question. Yeah, during this COVID time, a beautiful thing would have been uh, drones picking over for deliveries. I don't see anything on that uh, side happening. Uh, even the government would have actually allowed or be. Uh, more cooperative on that side in terms of regulatory front vijay is there a question Talk yeah is that is it's a question i don't see anything happening so why is that uh, probably maybe, maybe i can just um, can uh, speak about it yeah so i think that you know um it's taken um the government some time um on the regulations around drones i think it's still not uh, fully complete uh, but they have given preliminary permissions to a couple of folks 
um, to uh, start to test. Unfortunately, all of this happened uh, right at the same time. So I think that, uh, you know, those tests will probably move out uh, a little bit further than I think what we would have wanted. Dunzo is one of the companies that has been given, uh, one of the two companies that has been given the clearance to at least test. Um, it would have been great. I think it's a great question. And it would have been great to have had this, you know, uh, all sorted out six months ago. Um, and, and this would have been a phenomenal time to have tested that in live. But I think um, we'll have to wait a little bit longer. Um, but it is something that the government is uh, keen to, to look at. Um, there are some clear logistical issues um, here. But uh, nonetheless, um, they are definitely looking at uh, opening this up um, further. So um, that's, that's kind of what I can share right now, yeah. We can have the next question from Karthik Sagarwal. Can we give the audio to Karthik? I think Karthik is unable to get through. Yeah, audible now? Yeah, please. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, so I had a couple of questions. Uh, first one for Prashant specifically. Uh, so considering the last mile uh, logistics or uh, the unit economics, uh, so what is your take on charging uh, convenience fee from the users for the hyperlocal grocery deliveries in the longer run? And uh, if I have to look at the percentage recovery, cost of recovery wise, how much of the LM cost should one look to recover from the convenience fee? Uh, second question was to uh, country delight to Chakradhar. Uh, considering you're a D2 uh, direct to consumer brand, uh, is your supply chain structure to deliver straight from the warehouses or dark stores? And also considering the limited shelf life of the products that you offer, do you see a future where you partner with Kirana stores or say with cold storage facilities to function as hyperlocal partners? And uh, do you also plan of entering into more essentials in the near or longer future? Sure, I'll take uh, Karthik the first question quickly. So I think what we're seeing, as I mentioned on the call, is that we're seeing consumer behavior change, which is increasing both frequency of their orders as well as uh, the amount of purchases they're making per order. We've seen the average order value increase 2x, and this is post the whole hoarding period. Um, now, if this continues, you know, um, we, we, we will continue to improve our unit economics. Having said that, we're doing two things. One is, um, you know, we are seeing a marginal increase um, in uh, delivery fees, and consumers have been open to that. Um, we will see how that goes, you know, post COVID, whatever that phase ends up being. Um, but we do believe that uh, consumers are. Uh, certainly being open to uh, to a small increase in the delivery fee. The second is that um, we've also opened up tipping. This is a very interesting other behavior. We never expected anybody in India to tip. Um, and it could be that it's a COVID phase phenomena, but uh, consumers are really happy and appreciative of the work the delivery partners are doing and have been, um, you know, um, uh, providing tips to them. Um, and that's also helping us make sure that our partners are making um, sufficient amount um, of, of earnings that, you sh that they should be making. So um, w between these things, what we're finding is that we've, we've not uh, imp increased any commissions to merchants. And so maintaining that at the same level, um, our unit economics are actually going up. So, uh, Karthik, on your uh, question uh, regarding Country Delight and its plan to uh, work with uh, uh, retailers, 
see candidilite uh, even before the covid was primarily born uh, with the intention of giving pure and fresh products to customers and uh, you know milk is a perishable product which has a 4 hour shelf life and you know out of the like 7 8 years of candidilite's existence 6 years uh, were spent in mastering the idea of giving a high quality product with the adequate cold chain with the right uh, processing directly to the doorstep of the customer so we tried in the past to work with the retail chains but we found that you know there were very few people who had the kind of focus we needed on on the cold chain and uh, it was never really economically viable but uh, you know if you know things change and you know we see people focusing more on cold chain uh, uh, as as businesses we would love to partner with them uh, uh, but you know that is one of the core things why we started direct to home and why we uh you know uh why we ensure that there is cold chain all the way and we invest quite a bit even at the dark stores in cold chain of the product so i find it less likely that uh, we will partner with retailers and uh, to the second question uh, on on the on the basket of produce or the way ahead for country delight we have been a customer obsessive brand uh, when it came, when it comes to uh, the brand promise which is pure and fresh product that can be tangibly differentiated with taste we we absolutely live this philosophy and uh, we will continue launching products in this direction some of the products that we are going to launch with are in the fruits and vegetables space we are looking at leafy vegetables uh, as the next target segment for us because it's highly perishable it's fresh in nature and customers can easily figure the perceptible difference between a fresh product and a non fresh product so the broader direction for us is snv unadulterated oils uh, batters these this is the broader set of fresh product items that as a brand we plan to uh, get into considering the paucity of time we'll just take one last question uh, from mr anirudh singhal can we please give audio to anirudh you everybody hear me yes okay uh, so the question is uh, i'm actually a e bike provider in a small tier 3 city uh, doing some partnership with zomato and we doing like 40 bikes with them as of now planning to go state wide uh, with 200 bikes in a in a, in a matter of month uh, so what uh, really gives confidence in this in this bad time is that yulu made news on 11th april uh, wherein they had done partnership with zomato and netmeds for deliveries and uh, what are your views i mean uh, at this time does it really make sense for the hyper local apps to partner with the uh, e bike providers uh, and the second part of the question is does it make a sense uh, for you to directly partner with the e bike provider or does it does it make sense to uh, motivate your delivery partners to do the partnership or take the bikes from uh, such e bike providers thank you uh i can take one part of the question i think just answering the latter part of the question it always makes sense to actually get more delivery boys uh to take e bikes directly from you rather than uh, engaging with a platform uh because it is essentially the delivery boy who is paying for the e bike okay like a zomato kind of a platform will have to then again hire a delivery partner which is going to be a challenging task and uh, for zomato it does not really matter whether they take it from you or they bring their own themselves so from like even some of the thing that we see and like the way we work with some of the uh, e bike providers today is that we basically expose them to the delivery fleet that we have and it's better that uh, basically you guys go out there and actually pitch to the delivery boys to use it in a certain way Yeah, just Prashant. I'll just echo some of that. Um, I think the other thing that we would do is, um, you know, or you should do is there are some various financing models because at the end this comes to 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 financing and the cost of running an e-bike. You know, um, to pay upfront for an e-bike would be too expensive right now. They already have the bikes. What do they do with their existing bikes? Um, but for any new partner um, that you want to have on the bike, you can get investors to essentially. um finance the bikes 
and lease it out to a partner, a delivery partner, um, at, a, at a rate that would be very sustainable. And some of the models we've seen, um, it sure feels like we're getting pretty close to uh, making the economics work. Um, and in that case, you know, a Zomato or a Swiggy or, or a Dunzo um, would just help organize this, help negotiate the right kind of pricing, um, you know, at, a, at an aggregate level. But uh, I think it was Abhishek, as, as he said, um, the specific uh, transaction then would be done through the delivery partner. Um, yeah. Thank you, panelists. I think this will be all, and we'll have to conclude uh, the webinar here. I'm sure the industry will surely relook at its distribution infrastructure in the new normal post the lockdown. Thank you so much for taking out time, and I'm sure in future we'll all meet not in the confines of our houses, but in some more physical spaces. Thank you for joining us today. Over to you, Pratima. Sure, thank you all the panelists for joining us. I think it has been a fantastic session. We've been getting a lot of messages on the good quality content uh, we've been able to achieve over here. And like Punita said, uh, hopefully we'll meet again uh, outside this virtual space. Uh, there were a lot of questions which uh, went unanswered. We'll try sending it to our panelists and see if we can get answers to those later. I would also request all the delegates to please help us fill the short survey form after this. Uh, it'll help us improve our future webinars. Thank you, everybody, for joining in. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Punita. Thank you, Kapil. Bye. Thank you, Chakrita. Thanks, Prashant. Thanks, Abhishek. Bye-bye.